All right, you've been asking what happened behind the scenes on the ACS call floor. We're gonna get into that today with Vin from Vin and Sori. There's a lot of dirt here, so you're gonna wanna watch to the end. So without further ado, let's go. Okay, so I think probably the best place to start is in order. Like you were, you both were in Live Bridge before it was ACS yes, in the, in the middle. building. Yeah, so like I didn't start until we were in the old Ames building, 2007 or 2008, I think I started. Um, yeah. So we can talk about some of the sketchy stuff with ACS or Live Bridge as we go, but as far as the murders are concerned, I think probably the best place to start is Donna Parody. And yes. So I was, I think I had just quit to go back to school and then all that happened, but you two were like right in the thick of it. You were a supervisor? I was, right? I was actually Donna's supervisor, mm -hmm. rest in peace to her, um, when she was killed. So Donna at the time was pregnant. Mm -hmm. She was about seven or eight months pregnant, yeah. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think she was eight based and on the research I found, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really pregnant, but really excited because she had just gotten engaged. Yeah. And she was gonna get married and she had this baby. And so it, I remember, cause I was her supervisor, pretty much every, there's this girl, Katie, uh, this other dude, and then Donna, I would, we would give them rides. So if you were a soup and you had cars, we would we would give people rides, especially in the winter in Maine. Yeah. It's just it's brutal. So I remember, you know, giving Donna a ride because she was walking. I was like the person that was driving her for what I called out or whatever. I was mm -hmm. like, I got you after work, you know, just hang out a little bit because she she ended half an hour before I did, and so she waited for me and I was able to drive her. And you know, she was kind of quiet. I don't know if you got to interact with her. She was a little bit. Not really. Like, I didn't even know who Donna was until, you know, she disappeared. And I never got to meet her, so. Beautiful, beautiful. I mean, you, I mean, you've seen the pictures. Yeah, seen yeah. yeah. She, she was very um, quiet, shy. She wouldn't talk a lot to a lot of people, but when she was around the girls, you know, they, you know, they kind of stick together. And mm -hmm. the older girls, yeah. they can talk to each other. And, and uh, so she had a little crew. But uh, you barely heard anything from her. A really good worker. She never gave me any trouble. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> she was not a very good salesperson, which we were a sales thing. Yes. But <laughs> she was so nice that, you know, she never came up in the back office discussions with the managers. And stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how, you know, when you lose somebody like that, that you work so close to, it's, it's tough. But that's how I remember her is that car ride that her and I had. And, and uh, I was talking about the snow and, talking about her kids and, mm -hmm. and uh, she was very very excited to get married for sure I mean obviously that was the first murder in that building what was the worst because there, there's a lot of like sketchy people there was some weird stuff going on there but what was like the worst thing you had heard of happening at ACS criminally <sighs> up until that point yeah so I was a I was a supervisor so as a supervisor I was involved with interviewing and hiring people mm-hmm mm -hmm. And for me, when I would hear rumors, I would just say that's impossible because I myself, if, you know, you go through hiring crunches, you know, where you have to have X amount of people yes. and the client is, you know, yelling at you, how come you guys aren't staffing? You're like, oh, we're going to hire people. And so I've been in really desperate situations where we needed headcount and the candidate was awesome. But then you get a call from recruiting that says, this person didn't pass the background. You can't hire them. Mm -hmm. So from my vantage point as a supervisor, I was like, oh, that's all. That's just urban legends. Those are myths. They wouldn't even get through the door, you know, with our policy because we've been in desperate situations where we had to hire, where I would have hired anybody and it got shot down. So I didn't believe any of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe any of the stories. I just took it as, because I'm from New York City. So I'm from like the Bronx, New York. So I just took it as, Lewiston is like the, the inner city in Maine, so they're they're making up all these urban legends. That's how I yeah. took it. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't really believe any of the over the top stuff just because I thought that's impossible. There's no way they'd get hired. Mm -hmm. So to your knowledge, they were doing background checks. So the rumor was they were kind of skimping on the background checks there for a while. I know personally, I was never background checked, but I was very very early on because I was one of the Live Bridge. That was, oh, yeah, you were a live bridge OG. Same with me. They didn't background check yeah. me either. Um, you wouldn't found anything. <laughs> um, yes, I do. Re well, well, here, I don't know if you guys remember this, but 
when we moved from the Bates Mill to the Ames building, mm-hmm. the guy in charge oh. was, was like... I liked him. Oh, oh he, I liked him. He, I described him as Michael Scott from The Office. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Like, he was literally that guy. Like, literally, corporate had to come in and, like, hold his hand the whole nine yards. Like, it was exactly... As a matter of fact, the way that I got introduced to The Office was... We were talking about him, and I was like, I can't believe this guy is, like, running our entire shop. Like, this is insane. This guy is the nicest guy on the planet, just massively incompetent, bro. Like, like he hired me as a supervisor, it, like, it, directly, because there was, was no one to interview me. If well, this is who I'm thinking of, did he... Somebody had, like, a works bomb. It was, like, uh, and he went out back and kicked and, it. Okay, so this happened. I was just about that to bring happened. this yeah. up. That happened. Somebody right. had one of those that. those canister shells for, like, military artillery that are hollowed out that some people use as ash trays or they fill it with sand and put it in the back of their truck. That's what happened. Mm-hmm. Someone had it in the back of their truck to weigh it down, and it rolled out. Yeah. So they thought there was a bomb. So this particular person went out and kicked it. It was right in the front, this the front is the, parking this lot. This is the director, not of a project. Because we had a call center. site manager, right? right? You have a call center, right? And usually, like, if you're calling a T-Mobile or whatever, you're not calling T-Mobile directly. They're outsourcing to another group, and that's right. who, who you're exactly. talking to. So we'll have, like, a T-Mobile, Verizon. You have a bunch of them in the building, and then mm-hmm. you have people that run those specific projects. Mm-hmm. But then you have the site director who's responsible for everybody. The bomb tester was our site director. Yes. It was not. So this is like a Michael Scott type kid. I, mm-hmm. Everybody loved him, mm-hmm. just like Michael Scott. Like, you watch it, you love him, but you're like, glad he's not my boss. Like, holy mo-. The guy was great guy, but completely incompetent. Okay. So during that period, mm-hmm. we had to staff our, our campaign. The, the, the campaign that we were on was an extremely volatile client. They're, they were very forward thinking. If I mentioned them, you know who they were. They were very forward thinking. They were very kind of at, at the edge of things. And so because of that, it was hard to manage them as a, as a, as a client because they were so demanding and, and they were so out of the box that the normal things that you could say to calm them down, you couldn't calm them down. Yeah. So like we went through a period for a whole month where they said, if you guys aren't at XYZ, we're pulling your project. So that's hundreds of jobs. That's, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you know what that kind of pressure yes. is like. And um, we were able to, you know, we had a couple of rock star supervisors who were able to pull us out of it and literally save the project. Well, then the client went from we're going to cut you guys to you guys need to staff up to five hundred in three months, which is, we never did it. It's, a, yeah. we we failed. But it was during that time period when that was happening with site director Michael Scott, that the the standards for hiring went down exponentially. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the justification for it was, if we can't get these people in time, then people are going to miss out on all these jobs, and we can provide 500 jobs for people. So you're in the inner city in Lewiston, Maine, and so there's this whole, hey guys, this is great news, you know, and as a person in the who, who's been in the industry, like, I've seen that's where a lot of mistakes get made, mm-hmm. is not being able to say no. Is because all of those seats represent $200,000 or whatever. So you're multiplying 200 k by 500 seats. That's all they're thinking about. They're not thinking about anything else. So it was in that situation where you have a very demanding client asking for all these people, compounded with, you have a guy who's running the site who is not the most competent individual. So his decision was, we're going to lower the standards for hiring. We're going to look the other way on on non-rehirables as well as we're going to look the other way on uh, uh, criminal background check. Unless it's a crime of honesty. Right? So if the, the client we were in found out that you hired someone who had a crime of honesty, that's a person who plays around with money, mm-hmm. right? Then we could be in serious trouble. But the other crimes, not so much. 
So, so we had could, people in our campaign that were crime of honesty that they just kind of let And go. they still, uh, yeah. but you were on a, uh, uh, a I, healthcare campaign, remember? No, I was on a uh, credit card customer, a credit card rewards customer service okay, financial campaign. financial service. Okay, yeah. so that's how bad it got. So even there, mm-hmm. so, so initially it was, well, we can look the other way on these types of things as long as it's not crime of honesty because our particular client only looked for crimes of honesty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just want people to understand, like, you were on a similar campaign. If the if they found out you hired somebody that had crime of honesty in their background, they pulled the campaign. Like, I've read the contracts, okay? It's called a statement of work. I've read the SOWs, and all of them universally have that in there. So the fact that that was being allowed to happen, again, it indicates how loose the standards were being held to, say it that way. Yes. And it was in that time period that Richard was hired. So another thing that I heard that's out there is pretty soon while we were still over at the Bates Mill, he started harassing a co-worker mm. and sexually assaulted her. Well, is that a, is that a thing? There, there was a co-worker that actually went to me specifically about Richard. So I went to Richard and I said, hey man, and you know, he gave a statement and then I went to my, uh, to my manager and I said, hey, here's the situation, here's what's going on. I do not know what the follow up was after that. She said over and over again, nobody listened to me, nobody listened to me. And I understand why she said that because when it got escalated, you know, you're taught to keep, keep these things, you know, private, right? Because if somebody accuses you, this is still America, you're still innocent until proven guilty, you have to do an investigation. So when I when I escalated that to our OM, I didn't hear anything about it. But that did I interpreted that as, oh, he's keeping confidentiality, this is over my head, because this this guy's about to get himself fired. But that was also during the period she reported that and I escalated it during the period that we were transitioning from Bates mm-hmm. to the Ames building. Yes. So I never heard anything about it ever again. She never came back to me. She wasn't on my team, but the girls kind of knew if you have a problem, you go to me. I'll, I'll try to try to follow up or, or whatever. I don't play around with that stuff. But um, she never came back to me. So I said, okay, like the, the situation is squashed. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I never heard about him actually sexually assaulting her. The story she told me was he cornered her in a smoke shack. And so was saying some pretty suggestive things to her because Richard used to hang out with, um, there was a whole crew of people that Richard was part of. And they were all younger than him, by the way. It was, they were like mm-hmm. our age and Richard at the time was like in his 40s, like yes. mid-40s. And we were in our 20s. And we were, he was giving a lot of them rides, Yeah, from what I understand. We were, we were kids in our 20s mm-hmm. and Richard was hanging out with like all of our friends, all the ones we used to talk to and hang yeah. out with. He got this 40 plus, but everybody loved him. Everybody in that crew, everybody loved him. So like, even after everything came out with him, they were, mostly girls were protecting him and saying, you know, they couldn't believe he would do such a thing. But mm-hmm. according to this woman, he cornered her in a smoke shack and said a bunch of sexually suggestive things to her, things that he wanted to do, etc. And one of them came up to me and said, hey, I heard so-and-so said this about Richard. It's not true, yada, yada, yada. And I said, oh, I said, were you there? Because I'm still, still like, you know, if I get extra information, I'm going to send it to my OM. She goes, well, no, I wasn't there. And I said, well, then how do you know that? You, you see what I'm saying? Well, I know Richard. Like, well, I, you've been around him for three months. Like, mm-hmm. like, I know when you met him, unless you knew him outside of work. Like, what do you mean you know him? But anyway, um, so that's what happened. You know, to this day, I don't, I don't know what the truth is. I mean, obviously now considering everything that happened, mm-hmm. it appears um, that he was, you know, guilty of that as well. But yeah, she did, she did report that and she did. And then nothing happened. It really feels like that happened quite a bit. Cause I remember my first drama that I had to deal with, with a supervisor was a police officer called me at my desk stating that a sexual assault happens in our parking lot between one of my agents on my campaign and an agent on your campaign. And that there was a pregnancy involved. And 
after that, I don't think there was any sort of follow up. The when you would talk to corporate, because you know after the the Donna situation, you know we were on America's Most Wanted at one point. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Wow. Rich ended up on America's Most Wanted, so we the our client was extremely worried about optics. So we like for example Donna's daughter who actually works with us ended up winning a settlement and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Yeah. But but so so corporate their main fear was how we appear to other potential clients or how we appear to our current list of clients. That was a major one of the major reasons why we went through another name change iteration. Uh, was 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 mainly because of that. I mean, our reputation took a massive, massive hit. So the priority for corporate was almost 100% financial. It was 100% how do we look to our clients, et cetera, et cetera. So everything was about, in my from my vantage point, obviously, and I, I'm just a kid in my 20s at the time. Yeah. What do I know? But it appeared to me that it was just about shoving everything under the rug, Eh, nothing happened, we'll move on. And, you know, firing people in the ba- out the back door or whatever, you know, solving the problem in a, in a way that didn't let the rest of us know, hey, this is going on. Mm-hmm. Hey, guys, this is unacceptable. We will fire you. Hey, girls, this is unacceptable. Report it. That wasn't going on. Mm-hmm. It was just you had a group of people you could talk to, and they would they would listen to you. Yeah. People thought, oh, you could talk to Vinny, but they're – I mean, I'll admit there wasn't much I actually could do mm-hmm. other than what they told you to do. And obviously, you know, to this day, it's, it's something that, you know. Yeah. I just remember after it happened, both times after it happened, they'd have the Lewiston police come in and give some, like, total, like, crapshoot self-defense thing for the ladies. Yeah. They'd install some security that basically, they didn't, I don't think they even had a taser. Just to make they, people feel happy. They put, after Donna died, they put uh, security cameras in the back. And, again, when I look at the SO, the, the statements yeah. of work, all of them, all of our clients said that the entire building should be surveilled. It was like 280 degrees of surveillance yeah. or something like that. Basically, the front and the back had to be. And then if you were a standalone building, then the sides, you were responsible mm-hmm. for the sides. Like, I looked at the SOWs. It took a murder for that to happen. Yeah. And and then on the back end, there was nobody monitoring those videos. So it wasn't like the cameras were there for any sort of prevention or or like in motion interdiction. It was all post. So if you got raped, now we can at least see. But nobody was actually like monitoring the cameras to make sure anybody was safe back there. Right. But, but even in post, they didn't even use it. So there, I had a friend on another campaign. This was probably 2010, she had an ex-boyfriend come, took a can of paint, dumped it on her car, and I think he might have broken a window. So they have the tapes pulled. Louis and PD that. comes in. I remember that. And they say, yeah, we can't really see what goes on in here, and if you, if you want to pay us to upgrade our software, we'll do something about it. Other yeah. than that, you're screwed. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a major thing. So, so my campaign gets into this big hiring blitz, and I interviewed a couple people. And one of the people, there's a group of people I interviewed. One of them was a brother sister couple. Yes. Well, they weren't a couple, but you see what I'm saying. So the the, I interviewed the sister first. The sister was probably the best interview at the agent level I've ever done in my entire life. She was entrepreneurial. She was brilliant. She very bright. Just she believed everything. She's you can just tell that girl's got. She's a man. She's gonna be a manager. So that was Brandy. Is this a Brandy? Brandy. Yeah. So I hired her like halfway into the interview. She said, oh, my brother is coming too. Well, I said, oh, what's his name? I'll look out for him. Her brother's name is Buddy. So it's, I cool. So I go to talk to Buddy. Buddy gives an okay interview. It wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. But Brandy was his sister. So I'm like, all right, we'll hire her. That's fine. So I hired, I hired both of them. Brandy, another campaign stole her like immediately. Yes. <laughs> I I was so angry. There was a lot of back office conversations about that. I'm like, I interviewed her, blah, 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 blah. They're like, thank you very much for being a team player. And they took that girl. They, anyway, 
I'm still sorry about that because I knew she was going to make us a lot of money. But um, but Buddy ended up on my campaign, and you were, I don't know if you were with me at the time, but it was with me. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we're going to keep that in here, but anyway. One of your female you ops at the time. I, your supervisors. I got promoted to an ops manager, so now I've got supervisors reporting mm-hmm. to me. So one of my female supervisors comes in there and she goes, yo, that buddy dude is weird. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, he's saying all types of weird stuff to me. And I said, what stuff? And she goes, ah. So she starts like skirting around. And I was like, no, tell me, what is he, what did he say? Well, he said something sexual to her. And I said, she goes, just leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. Well, the Donna thing had happened like a year before. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm not, I'm not escalating. I'm not doing any of this. I'm just going to fire the dude. So he came in. I said, did you say this to her? And he basically said, oh, I was just joking, blah, blah, blah. I was like, cool, bro, give me your badge. So I took his badge and I turned it. I didn't go to, and you know, like when you, when you go to terminate somebody, yeah. it's a giant process. You go to HR, you've got to have four write-ups before, yep. blah, 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 blah. HR you, approval. Yeah. And HR will say, well, have you warned them before? So like you shot somebody on the call for it. Like, well, did you, did you, did you warn them not to shoot anybody? Did yeah. you put out a memo? Blah, blah, blah. And so my thing is like. I'm not going to have that on my conscience. I don't care if I get fired. Like, yeah. I can deal with being fired. I can't deal with being... Because, I mean, I'm partially responsible for the down thing, no matter what anybody says, in my opinion. So, Buddy's there. I'm like, you're out. You're gone. He's like, just like that. I'm like, just like that, bro. Give me your badge. You're out. So, I fired Buddy immediately. He's gone. My supervisor comes back in. She goes, what the hell? What are you doing? I said, I'm not playing with that. Because if he's doing that to you and you're a supervisor, mm-hmm. then guarantees he does it to somebody else. So that was my that was my rule of five, right? Like if one person comes to you, that means five people are experiencing right. it and they're not gonna tell you. Especially women in the workplace. It just they will they will not, it doesn't matter how powerful they are, they just won't. Mm-hmm. So that's part of the reason I'm doing this, like, is to try to get people to be like, yo, this is really important. The type of person that will do that to a woman is, is it's not like a, a sexual assaulter and a, and a murderer live in different galaxies. The, 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 the mental framework that goes into being a rapist is almost exactly similar to being a murderer. You don't have any value for a person's personal mm-hmm. body autonomy. People are not important to you. The only thing that's important is you and what you can get out of this experience. 100%. Yeah. So... I, it, what, is what I did right? No, because I took her word against his, I didn't give him a fair trial, and I was completely biased because I'd been working with this girl for a year at, at that time. She was one of my folks, and I was never, I just swore to myself, I'll never let that happen to him. So, technically on paper, I didn't do the right thing. Like, the guy's supposed to have his day in court and all the rest of it, mm-hmm. but the fact of the matter is, I had just been through... And all of us had just been through a traumatic right. situation, and I was not going to be part of that anymore. So I turned the guy. I'm like, you're out. Then I made a non-rehirable, because you can go in the system and say, you know. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes it's not the right time for a person. A person comes back, they do great. So I've seen that happen. So I was always, you know, if you wanted to fire somebody, and I, I said, all right, Jess, well, what are we doing? Are they hireable, non-rehirable? Mm-hmm. And usually, usually it was, you know, rehirable unless, you know, whatever. I yeah. was pretty... I would just go with what my suit said. But that guy, I made a non rehire And I explicitly said, sexual misconduct, because you can put it in the comment section. Mm-hmm. I'm floor walking two or three months later. I see Buddy on another financial campaign talking. I'm looking around like, maybe this is his brother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yuddy or something. <laughs> uh, so I go to one of the main guys in at, on that project and I said that guy's that guy's back they're like yeah yeah his buddy his buddy uh, Levi gave him a good word yes at this point he was on my campaign I had moved over to membership yeah so you didn't know that, that had happened no. prior to this at all I had no. no idea he just came into that training class with all of those problematic people mm-hmm. that I was telling you about that training class we had the one guy that was always screaming all the time. Yeah. We had all these people who were showing up drunk. They all quickly became homeless for whatever reason, including Buddy, and lived over at the it's Travel strange, Lodge. It was the strangest thing. That was, was a Travel Lodge class. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Everybody heard about that class, yeah. by the way. Because it, it was, was such terrible. A, it was I again. I didn't believe it, but it was a really bad class. It was right? a very bad class. <laughs> but again, you guys, you guys, uh, were on a big, big hiring crunch. It was a big hiring thing. They did not care who they were hiring. Like these people were terrible. I had like marched out of there on my lunch break. I'm like, I can't do this. They need to all go. And my ops manager at the time didn't class. even care. Nothing worse than a bad class. Mm -hmm. That was one of our major, major... We always had fights with... Remember this? We'd fight with recruiting, mm -hmm. and then we'd fight with training. Because people would come out, folks couldn't read. <laughs> like, yeah. So I'm like, I'm not exaggerating. So it, so he ends up on the phones again. Yes. And I'm like, how did this guy get back? I'm like, he was not read. They're like, yeah, but his buddy put in a good... Because Levi... Now, Lee, now, remember, I mentioned Brandy. Brandy... They, they kidnapped Brandy immediately and yes. took her. She took off. She did very well, like, right out the gate, mm -hmm. right? And uh, Brandy and Levi are dating. Yes, right? at this yes. point. Which Brand is a very weird situation because he was the trainer. And I heard some things about the two. The whole situation. Happening in the smoke area. Allegedly. Allegedly. I... So I didn't. It know. happened. Apparently, they didn't catch that on the camera. So I didn't know. Well, you, it's all in post. So I didn't know about that. But what I saw was I just saw there was a lot of really young girls always around his table, always yes. seemed very, Levi's very friendly table. around Levi's table. Like even when he was on your original table. campaign, at night there were all these girls who were like barely like. Well, obviously, they're eighteen. You had to be eighteen to work there. But barely. So they'd be flocking around him, and he's like a man in his late thirties at the time. And the other thing about Levi was, at some point, I'll, I'll I'll find a picture. He was not a very attractive guy. Like not even a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like he wasn't. He was not a very attractive dude at all. So it was a very strange. He had these three dreads that he had in kind of like a like a man bun, mm -hmm. and then he it was just. Very strange dude, yes. which, which is fine. Like obviously, I'm I'm weird. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a supermodel either. But it was just very strange because Brandy Brandy was not very pretty, but she was put together. Yes, she was very functional. You could tell she was high functioning, like right. No, yeah, she was. She wasn't like I'm a saying, supermodel, but like no, she was yeah. very well put together. Right, and she was very charismatic. Correct. Right. Yeah. And Levi. It, he was just, like, he was a little charismatic as well. One hundred percent. I'm just talking about his physical appearance. Oh, I could yeah. never. I couldn't. No. I couldn't figure out anything that was going on in that little ecosystem. Um, to this day, I still don't understand how he had all those girls around him, other yeah. than maybe Brandy. But but anyway, so long story short, this Levi guy hired rehires Buddy. Mm -hmm. Levi is with Brandy. And I guess Levi is friends with Buddy. So Levi and Buddy are friends, and then and then and then Levi and Brandy are together. Yes. Which made no sense, but whatever. I mean, that's me and Sorry together doesn't make sense either. So it is what it is. Okay. So so yeah. So so there's Levi and Buddy and Brandy. So I fired I fired Buddy because of the experience that I had. The year earlier with Donna and uh, Richard Richard Dwyer. So if we were to fl flash back there a year previous to that, we moved to the to the new building. Everything's going fine. I drop Donna off or whatever, and then the next day, you know, a couple of days later, I come to work. Donna's at not there. So Mike comes up to me. Mike is her supervisor at the time. Mike, who is extremely meticulous about the performance of all of his agents. So he comes up to me. He goes, Donna didn't show up to work today. Now, Mike was the best supervisor in the building, in my opinion, as far as, like, the, the nuts and bolts of what you need to be a, you know, whatever. He was on all of this stuff. Me, I didn't know that my folks were gone until, like, the third person. Now, I'm like, oh, wait a second. This, this person isn't here. But Mike, Mike knew everybody. He knew everything. He knew if you were a minute late. He knew if you were a minute late. He knew if you were 20 seconds over on your lunch. Like, dude, Because he play. showed me how to find that. Right. <laughs> and, and he knew. And there's nothing you could do. Like, he knew, he knew his stuff. Anyway, he comes up and he says, he says, Don, now Mike was my best friend on the floor. He's my guy. So he comes up and he's like, Don isn't here. I'm like, all right. Everybody else here? He's like, yeah. But I'm going to miss out on eight hours. You know, 
Next day, he comes up to me, completely stressed out. Donna's not there, and she's not picking up her phone. So, so Donna, so Mike is really, really invested in his folks. Donna was a really, really good worker. Like I said, wasn't the best salesperson, but as far as dependability, you depend on her. So this was a no-call, no-show two days in a row. Two, call, two no-call, no-shows in a row. Mike is terrified. Mm-hmm. I'm laughing. I'm like, Mike, come on, bro. Like, we're not the most important show in town. Something happened to her because she hasn't shown up to work for two days. Come on, bro. Like, relax. He's like, I'm telling you, Vin, she wouldn't do this. She wouldn't do this, blah, blah, blah. Something happened to her. I'm like, she'll be back to work tomorrow, bro. We good. He's like, yeah, I'll give him a little hug. You're good, man. Don't worry. You're good. I send him back to the same. Next day, I show up. Somebody intercepts me before I can get to the door. Have you seen Donna Perry? I'm like, my first thought was, this fool went and called the police. He freaked out and he called the police. I said, nah. I mean, I, I, I drove her, you know, I gave her a ride last week. And the guy's like, you gave her a ride? Where'd you give her a ride? Where'd you go to? What color is your car? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like. <laughs> was this a cop or a private investigator? This is a, this is a detective. Okay. Turns out he was in regular. He starts grilling me. So I'm looking at dude like, he's like, let me see your car. So I'm like, okay. And he asked me all these questions, blah, blah, blah. He's like, who's the last person you saw her with? All this CSI shit. I'm like, yeah. I'm still not, pro- this whole time I'm thinking about Mike. I'm like, yo, bro, you're going to be so embarrassed when she walks through them doors, bro. <laughs> you're going to be so embarrassed. So I went straight to Mike. I'm like, Mike. I told you she was going to be good. He goes, yeah. He's like, look. I'm like, yeah, you called him. He's like, I didn't call anybody, bro. Her daughter put out a missing purse. Like, we don't know where she is. And that's when it hit me like, yo, she's truly, we don't know where she is. And that was a really difficult moment for me. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, oh, my God. And, and it didn't even... Me or anybody, nobody thought it could be somebody from our group, which, of, which of course, it's the only thing she did. All she did was work, and she'd go home. That's all she did. Because she took care of her entire family. I don't know if you know who her brother is. Oh, Jesse. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, she was a matriarch of that entire family. Like, and that's why, like, her death, like, really hit me. Because when I was at the funeral, I'm like, it was just her kids. I'm like, these people have nobody, bro. Like, she was it for them mm-hmm. so so anyway it finally hit me like dang like, she's missing like this is really this is crazy and then like in the days after people were like well, what about the husband everybody's looking at the husband or the fiance because she was always talking about this dude but we could never see him well that's because he was in greece so mike's coming up to me he's like yo it's the husband blah 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 it's not a bitch da, da, da. and i'm like yo what, what happened bro he, like he went from greece kidnapped her and then i'm like well like like she's she's got she's got a she's got a little sister over here. She's got a daughter over here. She's gonna abandon her family. Like she would do that. And uh, he was like, he said something like he 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 killed her. And I was like, I was like, yo, I was like, Mike, you're crossing the line, bro. Like, relax. This is our coworker. Like, relax. And uh, I just remember coming to work, man, and. and sitting up in my station and like periodically looking at the doors like trying to like will her through the door or whatever mm-hmm. and uh it was weird richard richard dwyer so at the time the cops are like all all in dude's house they were pulling up this floor but i didn't know any of this yeah so he asked me for a bathroom break well he had just left five minutes ago so I just said something like, bro, you just took one like five minutes ago. He explodes on me on the floor. He yells, I'm a good person. Bob, what are you trying to say about me? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, huh? Like, Jeez. all I said was like, and I'm like, I'm like, yo, don't get in my face like that. What's wrong with you? Like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. Like, but he's yelling, screaming, veins popping out of his neck. All like, yo, bro, sit down, man. Like, relax, dude. Like, chill out. Like, what are you doing? Like, chill, relax. Coworker comes next to me. I'm like, I'm like, Mike's looking at me. Mike's like, what are you gonna do? 
Because Mike always was like, yo, you're too easy on people. So he's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, but I had, uh, remember that black dude? Uh, and he was, uh, he used to hang out with Ashley and that. Anyway, I, I, I had this black dude from Massachusetts, right? So he yeah. was, he, Crip dude, he was in a gang. He was gang gang. And uh, he was sitting in my pod because I had my little crew. So Richard yells at me on this on the floor, right? So this was like, yo, Vin, Vin, you want, I'm going to see this guy after. He's like, yo, I'm going to see him at the smoke shop, bro. I can get him from you. Da, da, da. Oh, I'm my like, God. Nah. I was like, nah, relax, relax, relax. <laughs> well, the other, the other supervisor, she's like, yeah, you got to go easy on this is This is the girl we were talking yep. about before we went live. He said, you got to go easy on him. I said, why do I need to go easy? He just yelled at me. He's lucky. He, he, she goes, well, you know, the cops are all in this house with everything and yada, yada, yada. I'm like, the cops are for what? They're like, so then... Mike says to me, Donna. And I'm like, like, holy smoke. And then everything like made sense. Like he flipped it out, telling me he's a good person, all this. Long story short, they find Donna's body. Her, she's dead. Baby's dead. He sexually assaulted her. Then he strangled her, killed her. And he just tossed her back there like she was garbage. And then he went... I went and listened. When they did the timeline or whatever, I went and listened to the first call he took after he killed her. He was completely fine. He was completely fine. Like, nothing happened. And, uh... And obviously, like, you know, like I said, like, you know, there was that previous reported incident or whatever. And I'm like, obviously, I didn't do everything I was supposed to do because I'm like... Because I argued myself. I was like, well, you." I went and escalated it. And then I'm like, yeah, but all you did was check a box. If that was your sister or somebody that you, you love that was in your crew. Because if, if he would have done that with you, it would have been a, completely different. Because it's you. Because you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're one of my folks. You know? And that's why when the other thing happened to my other supervisor, like, dude was gone immediately. Mm-hmm. Like, gone, gone. I'm not doing anything. I'm not even going to give you a fair trial. If you're innocent, I'm a Christian. God will take care of you somewhere else. I'm not doing it. I'm not allowing that to happen. So, I, you know, when that whole situation went down, like, everybody had all their opinions about Richard or whatever. I was just really quiet because I was just like, damn. Mm-hmm. Like, damn. I just remember when site director Michael Scott brought all of us into the conference room to let us know that Donna was missing and that the person possibly responsible was in the building as well. Correct. Which he was not supposed to do for a bunch of reasons. Yeah. He literally, while this dude was under investigation, literally told everybody, by the way, this guy's under investigation. Oh, he even named Richard. No! Okay. He didn't name, did he? I think he did. I think he did. Wow. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, even just to say, hey, the murderer could be in the same building Correct. walking among you. But the Correct. thing about it was, is like, I wasn't on that campaign. Obviously, I sat adjacent to that campaign, but I yeah. knew who they were talking about. Yeah. So he, he had to have named him. I can't just be like misremembering and, it because I knew who it was. And our community, again, this is Maine, mm-hmm. okay? It's so small that you don't need to name anyone. Yeah. Like if, if 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 Michael Scott, our director, would have came up and said, a black supervisor, everybody would have known you were talking about me. You know what I'm saying? Like we were, he might as well have said the guy's first, last name, social security number, address, whole nine yards. Like, yeah. he, and, and like, it was crazy because I'm like, okay, our director's going to talk to everybody. So that's good. Because I was really, especially the girls were terrified. The girls were, because we don't know exactly what happened yet. So all we know is some random dude took an eight-month pregnant woman and raped and killed her. So the rest of the girls were like, holy, like, yeah. if it could happen to her, I mean, she's eight months pregnant. She's not at the height of her, you know, you guys are all in your 20s. You guys are all beautiful girls in your 20s. So every, all the girls are scared. So I'm, I'm like watching. Everybody keeps coming out of these meetings. They look more terrified mm-hmm. than of all. I mean, some of those girls, it was their first job. Their Co- first job was an adult. <laughs> and, and, and here in Maine, we think like, die. oh, like murders can't don't happen you here. You may die. That happens and, in New York. And, and, and now they're like hearing this. They got to be freaking out inside. I was freaking out. I, in my car, under the floorboards, kept the big like chef knife for my block mm-hmm. and a, like, a claw hammer in my car for the longest time mm-hmm. after that. Yeah, one of my... One of the one of my female soups that went to one of these meetings, 
She 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 wouldn't leave. I had a good six months. I had to walk them all out to their car mm-hmm. for a good six months. They would not. They they're like whatever. We're not going anywhere unless you're coming with us. Period. End of story. So it was it was a terrifying time. But now that I think now that I'm hearing like he made it a lot worse. Like hey, there's a freaking murder on the loose. It might be here. Yeah. Like I, it was just our leadership. I mean, including me, our leadership completely failed. Yeah. These women at our, at our at our site, like, and that's uh, that's why I'm including myself because I know that that first situation, if it would have been my sister, or if you even if it would have been Jess, I would have been a lot more diligent about pursuing a resolution. But you went all the way with Buddy, and even though you went all the way and did all that you could do, it still didn't matter in the end. So I mean, that's just to say that maybe if you had gone all the way with him, maybe he still would have gotten brought back anyway during a hiring crunch. Mm-hmm. But the thing about this is, is I dropped the ball with Buddy. I dropped the ball with Buddy because I could have had him fired very easily. First so, point. So a couple of things. So he was accumulating points like crazy. Why don't we catch people up? I know we mentioned it on the other episodes. Let's right. catch people up on what points are here. So points basically well, were... Just, just give me two seconds. So, so, Richard, yeah. so the first woman is Donna. She was murdered by Richard about a year, year and a half later. Later. Uh, beautiful girl, Christiana, is murdered by Buddy. Buddy. So Buddy was accumulating attendance points. So it's basically if you're late, you leave early, you're absent, you accumulate these points. At seven, you get fired. He was accumulating them like crazy because he was leaving work consistently almost every single day from an hour to two hours early because he was going home to watch Brandy's son because lo and behold... Christiana and Brandy were running a prostitution ring. So Brandy, this very entrepreneurial, charismatic girl who I hired, and then I hired her brother, basically as a favor to her, mm-hmm. she's running a prostitution ring. Yes, as a madam. So so there's Brandy and her boyfriend, Levi, mm-hmm. and her brother, uh, Buddy. And Brandy, am I reading this right? Brandy was the... She was the mastermind. She was, she was the mastermind of all of this. Mastermind with a capital F. She was running the whole shop. Yep. So she was pimping girls out from our site. Yes. Is that, yes. Right? Is that right? As well as bringing girls down from Canada. Right. And then we had we had our, our receptionist was on her payroll for a while. Right? Was she? Is that true? Yeah. So the thing yeah. about the receptionist. Yeah, she was. Uh, so there's a couple of receptionists. I, I I'm thinking it's the smaller one. Yeah, she she was in the not the APB but the uh, the official document for his arrest. I forgot what it was. Yeah, it's like 16 pages. Yeah, mm-hmm. she got named in the affidavit as. Uh, That's she interesting. Told, she told detectives that she quit I, before... I, I didn't read a whole lot of names. There was Alanda from Canada. She was named, and then Brandy was named, and Christiana was named, yes. but I didn't see many other names. So Brandy actually told me, and I don't want to jump ahead too far about how I know any of this until we get there, mm-hmm. but she... We're getting there soon. She said she also had a woman on her payroll that was in Detroit, which... You know, she must have some sort of entrepreneurial spirit if she is pimping out a woman who's not even in her geographic location. And, and, and they were taking trips down to Foxwoods, which is a, a casino, um, probably the closest major casino to mm-hmm. us in Connecticut. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and Bye, they, yeah, and yeah. so they go down there and they work on the weekends and make crazy money. Yeah. And then at this point, she ends up quitting. ACS. What do you say? Work? What do you like? She's because yeah. that's legal down there, right? No. Sex work is legal down there. No, no. no. There, there's is that places least... in Nevada. There's a few counties in Nevada you can do that. Okay, but right. I think that's the only place in America that I know of off the top of my head. Right. I'm what sure our listeners about? will. Uh, Foxwoods is in Connecticut. It's yes. not in Las Vegas. Yeah. What am I talking about? Okay. So they would go to Foxwoods, and she would take her sex workers down there, yes. and that's how she'd make her. She'd make. She was making so much money. She basically quit. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. They're making quite a bit of money. So basically how this amounts to how I dropped the ball with Buddy was I could have got him on his points. Instead, what I did was I was like, hey, why don't you have Brandy drop Michael off over at work and he can sit at my desk and hang out with me so you don't have to leave. Michael is the kid. Yes, it's yeah. Brandy's son. Years old so, <laughs> so you're you're saying bring this kid in, mm-hmm. completely breaks all. But again, like this is this is what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. You know, this, this, that's why Michael Scott hired you, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, 
when you're not a very competent manager, like the best thing to do is hire very competent people who will work for you. So you look like a good manager. So I'm just, th- that's just, that's not, I just want people to know that's not typical. That's just, well, we should also be, be well, we should also be clear here. Uh, I know we explained this before, mm-hmm. but like Buddy was your right hand man. Right. So because if you had very little people to depend on, and Buddy was actually the most dependable out of those training classes. Yeah. Right? Wow. So, wow. Yeah. He was, he, he could coach agents. He was actually doing really well in his metrics. The, the people on the floor respected him, especially the older people respected him. Aside from this attendance issue, because he was going home because of the prostitution, mm-hmm. he was actually like completely like model citizen. Model yeah. citizen I mean, on my a campaign. Few people that told me that they thought he was a jerk, but a lot of people respected him. A lot of people had good things to say about yeah. him. Yeah. So the other point, which was pointed out to me after this all went down, of how you know, I dropped the ball here is my ops manager was extremely upset that I didn't tell her when I learned of the prostitution ring. Cause I jokingly said to him, I'm like, what's Brandy doing running a brothel out of your house? And he's like, well, actually, yeah. <laughs> I found out about this before the murder happens. And like, I'm like, oh, you know, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm very positive here. I don't have any problem with sex work. So I didn't tell anybody. Right, right. I mean, no, you didn't think it was going to lead to a murder, so no. why would you? But why would you? Why would you get people that you work with every day in trouble with the law? Right, and like on top of that, like Brandy and Christiana weren't working over at ACS anymore, and I didn't even know that like Levi was involved. So, so let's talk about Christiana. Yes, Christiana was on a completely different uh, project. So I was in financial services, mm-hmm. and you had about three or four many campaigns that were in that rubric and then you guys had a, the biggest one. You guys had the biggest one in the house. Yeah, uh, we were split. Hers was retention. Mine was also a financial services, so to speak. A credit card rewards mm-hmm. customer service. Yeah. And um, she was on the roadside, roadside assistance. assistance. Yeah. I only had one interaction with her. Her her director wanted her to do something like floor support or something like that. And I had just got out of his office because I was visiting with him. Um, cause I was the only person in the site that would talk to him, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so I was visiting with the homie and, uh, he said, look, when you leave, tell Christiana, she, you know, she's on floor support, which floor support means you're on the phone, but then you get to get off the phone and walk around and answer questions. Everybody that's done any type of phone work wants to do floor support. Yes. You want to be off the phone. You get to walk around when I was on the phones and the first time I did floor support, that's when my habit of not eating lunch or taking breaks came from. Mm-hmm. Because I would never take a break or lunch because I because when you came back, you would lose your floor exactly. support. Exactly. Yeah. Once you were on, you didn't take a break for the rest of the day if you yeah. could help it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, so I said, hey, uh, uh, Mark said you're good to go on the uh, on the floor support thing after this call. So she looked at me and she smiled. And she had an incredible smile. Yes. This is really just nice nice girl very beautiful so she smiled at me and she waved she said thank you and then uh i was like cool and i went back and uh that's the, that's the last time i ever spoke to her I never talked to her again after that mm-hmm. um so she christine christiana gets ends up missing yes so now this is a year year and a half after the Donna situation mm-hmm. she ends up missing i didn't know who she was I'm, I turn on the news. I see her face. I'm like, because oh. if you saw her face, you wouldn't, you, 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 you'll, you know who she is. Yeah. She just that smile, like that's the, that's the last thing I remember. Is like, her smile. I'm gonna try to find some pictures of her so the audience can see. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I true. I had no idea. I'm like, okay, now she's gone. What is going on? Mm-hmm. But I had, I had no clue as to the um, what was actually happening. So. I mean, we should probably say once we're in the Ames building, up to this point, having cops enter the building, it wasn't looking weird for people. It wasn't weird. Like people joked about it. Like seeing somebody in uniform walk in didn't bother or phase anyone. A anymore. lot of times, cops were just showing up to pick people up on their warrants. A mm. lot. That was like almost a once a week thing for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> We had Homeland Security show up for the the Chinese restaurant next door. And, yes, yes, that and, did and they, happen. And they were coming in with like I I didn't see this. Um, I was out back and I saw them running out the back. But apparently, like they came in with uh, AR-15s 
while people were sitting down eating, trying to arrest people. That's what I was told from a few people. So, you know, when yeah. stuff like that happens in your general vicinity, mm -hmm. you just become numb to it. Yeah. And then plus the, you know, I don't, I don't mean this disparagingly at all, but like after Donna happened, some people were like, okay, well, this is what happens here now. And people just talked to just made jokes that, oh, yeah. yeah, somebody else is going to get murdered here. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that was a major, 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 major thing. You can see, that's Christiana. Like I said, just incredibly beautiful girl. Mm -hmm. like, unbelievable. Um, but she was really nice. She was like, extremely nice. You never heard anything bad about her. But anyway, um, she went missing. And at the time that the investigation really started to pick up, I actually got transferred uh, down to Lexington, Kentucky. So when the actual investigations and stuff were going on, I was in uh, Kentucky doing completely different work. So I was like, I was getting stuff from Lewiston, you know, second and third hand. So I, I wasn't really around during like I was with the Donna situation. So mm -hmm. what was going on there with the investigations? And everything? So it was really, really strange. <laughs> I didn't know anything was happening until Buddy just started. He started to seem kind of sad. And I'm like, you know, what's wrong? He what? Cause this is after Christiana died? This is as, after Christiana died. when she died. was missing? Or? When she was missing. So she was already deceased, but when she was missing. So he was always like the life of the party at work. He actually brought up the morale on the floor, brought up my morale because my, right. cam yeah, my campaign was hell to work on. And he's like, oh, they're, they're looking for Christiana. He called her stupid because he didn't like her at all. And it was just kind of like strange because I'm like, why would he think she's stupid? Because she seemed pretty nice. But I'm like, okay. And it never really kind of went past that. Now, the investigation started really affecting his mental health. And he went and checked himself into St. Mary's, which is the hospital for, you know, the viewers. And, and that was after he was getting grilled by investigators and right. let something slip. Yeah, he had let something slip. He had said something to the effect of, I don't know where I put her. And after that, he checked himself into the mental facility at St. Mary's Hospital. And at that point, it started getting real at work because I was trying to hide from my ops manager the fact that he was in a mental institution and not showing up for oh, work. Oh, she didn't know. She had absolutely like no idea that he was gone. And then she started to kind of pick up on it. And I think it was because the police were probably talking to her and she was playing some sort of like manipulative so, game with me to so, get me to say something. So wait, they're, they're interrogating him or whatever. Mm -hmm. And in one of their questions, he slips out. I don't know where I put it. Yes. Holy smokes. Yeah. Yes. And, and they let him go, but then he checked himself into a mental institution. Yes shortly thereafter yeah so i believe my ops manager actually knew i think they were getting some information from work and um i'm like oh, i don't know i don't know i don't know i don't know what's going on and then i finally told her he is in a mental institution right did now he call, did he call you and tell you he was going i don't remember if he called me or brandy told me someone told me and then she had me try to get fmla for him and like do the whole process which i'm sure was denied and <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. <laughs> I so think fmla for, yeah. for for it's the family medical leave act yes that um it's protections for workers that get into that type of situation so that they don't get fired mm -hmm. so he doesn't get it obviously and i get a call from him after he is now out of the mental institution so i'm like okay how long did he stay he was in there for about a week about a week and so you're trying to cover up seven days of basically no call no shows basically yeah and it worked for a little while it did work for a little while they did have me terminate him but he he called me when he got out and i'm like do you want to go get coffee so i picked him up we went and got coffee so you did have to officially fire him yeah okay and it was so sad he like looked like just like a completely shell-shocked person it was crazy. He was not Buddy. Like, at least not the Buddy that I knew. And we drove around, drank coffee for a while. I remember at one point we were in um, Wales, Maine, because I was down some sort of back road, and the, a cop had pulled a bunch of people over. And he just kind of went crazy in the car, because there were all sorts of, like, blue lights. And I'm like, oh, boy. 
So we ended up wow. driving back. I parked near, you know, the house they were renting, gave him a hug, kiss on the cheek, and that's the last time I saw him. I believe they arrested him the next day. Now, Levi is still working at this, at this yes. point with us, right? Yep. So do you know, did he, was he hired as a supervisor on that campaign, or was he an agent on a campaign previous he and then transferred He was previous. He was on... He was an agent level with me. Yes. Did okay. he go to the other financial campaign before you guys took him? Or I never got him. No, he went straight to roadside assistance. Yeah, okay. I never got him. Wait, so he got hired as a supervisor directly? Oh, or a yeah. trainer. He so was as, a tra- as a trainer, he got and, uh, he got termed as an as an, at the entry level. Wait, the, Levi got termed. Where? Oh, uh, where? I'm I'm on crack. Okay, this entire set. Okay, so you're talking about Levi. Yeah. I was talking about Buddy. Like, wait a second, they mean Buddy? Okay, no, no, no. Yeah. Buddy so got hired he, in that. Got it. Got it. Okay, continue. I'm sorry. No, no, Go it's ahead. fine. He, Buddy got hired at the agent level and then came to me on my campaign. But, yeah. Oh, okay, but Levi, Levi was, was he hired directly as a trainer or did he start on another campaign? He started first? on Vin's original financial yeah. campaign. Okay, was he on your team? Were you his direct supervisor? Levi? I wasn't, but he was a monster salesman. Okay. So the emphasis on our campaign was sales and he was a monster. Mm-hmm. He, was, he, he was killing it. And obviously, he's a good salesperson. Obviously, yeah. like Brandy was was the the, the mastermind, but it it's, it's appears to me that he has some way, particularly with females, mm-hmm. to where he sells them and they they're buying. So yeah, you know whatever. And he had a career in politics afterwards. And he had a, <laughs> that. We're, Are we're you aware of that? Ahead, Did he try to run for mayor or something like that? He is currently on the Auburn City Council at large to this date and is on all sorts of committees. I found this out because when I used to vote in Ward 5 in Auburn, he'd always be at my voting place over at Washburn School. Now, he maintains his innocence and ignorance that he had no idea what was going on. He claims that Brandy, and there's, this is not alleged, there's an article in the Sun Journal that is still accessible to this day if you search his name, that he was like on drugs and that Brandy had seduced him and he was not in control and he left his like girlfriend and child to be with him and he was in an abusive situation it, it was just very strange I mean now I didn't know him personally but from my viewpoint in my opinion he seemed like somebody that was in control of himself <laughs> not somebody that was being used by others that's how it looked like to me nor was he ever described as somebody that was easily taken advantage of right. by others. But that's just my viewpoint. Well, again, if you heard this man operate on the phones, he's a master manipulator. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I'm sorry, it doesn't work for me. Now, do I believe that Brandy outsmarted him and used him? Absolutely. But that doesn't that doesn't absolve Levi at all because he also knew what he was doing to those girls. He just ran into somebody that happened to be more smarter and more manipulative than he was. Mm-hmm. But for him to try to use that, to your point, he was in complete command of his senses. And he he knew obviously how to speak to females in such a way as to get them to be malleable. They had a nice little thing going because you you, you don't expect the pimp, the exploiter, to be another woman. Mm-hmm. You expect the exploiter to be another man. So when a man comes in as the number two, and a woman is really the exploiter, it really it, it creates a situation where, yeah, you're going to get a lot of clientele, but you can't tell me that you didn't know what was going on, bro. And you can't tell me that that you were not manipulating and lying and doing all types of things to get these girls in these situations and you also can't tell me you had no idea Mm -hmm. about what happened to Christiana. Right. Two things. He was allegedly uh, transporting the girls. So that's what I heard from Buddy. Okay. Buddy said he was acting as a driver, which is a very interesting thing because all of those cars that were in their possession, which were higher end vehicles, there was a Lexus sedan, a Cadillac SUV, which was really nice because I've driven in it that. It was a Cadillac Escalade, correct? Uh, no, it no, was okay. it was some sort of more sportier type of okay. like SUV, and he had his Volvo. She she, I I talked to her once because you know I I messed with her and stuff because I hired her or whatever, and uh, 
she pulled up in this Cadillac. It must have been sixty, seventy thousand dollar vehicle, right. which in two thousand eight was a lot of money. Yes. So she, pulled, I'm like, yo, I'm in the wrong business, and she goes, yeah, you are, and of course, wow, yeah. <laughs> At the time, yeah. Yeah. I didn't really understand. Now I understand mm-hmm. what she meant. I know what you meant. It's your wicked self. All right. Yeah. Go no, it was, and it was a nice car. It was basically brand new because I rode in the car. I, I didn't and... understand how, how she pulled into this money, bro. Right. Well, but, we found out that. But they were all registered to Levi's name. All Zane. registered in Levi's name. And you had also mentioned that, did he perjure himself when he was under oath? I think you said everybody perjured Every himself. single person so perjured themselves. In what way did Levi perjure himself? perjure himself that you know of i'd have to review the affidavits but a lot of them said that they didn't have anything to do with it or initially said that they didn't know what happens but then under pressure from the main state police and people just hammering them gave it all up on on the prostitution ring or on the murder on the murder so they implicated themselves as an accessory to murder well they were they were all well, an accessory well, to murder. Yes, but a yeah. lot of them were claiming ignorance. So you're yes. saying they made it sound like they knew. Cause, yeah. Because I, I, these are just rumors. Like, on the phone, there was a lot of rumors at the time. But I heard rumors that allegedly he had something to do with transporting the body. So he claims that he did not. Mm-hmm. What he claims is that he wanted nothing to do with the transportation or disposal of Christiana's body. And Buddy had asked him to, and he was like, never mind, I'll do it myself. But he had asked, like, Levi to help. Okay, so Levi was made aware, yes. of, allegedly, by Levi, Buddy. Levi knew that her body was in the trunk. He knew completely. Yeah, I'm looking at the Sun Journal article, or the Bangor Daily News article. A witness testified Friday in a murder trial that he overheard the defendant suggest the body of the victim had been in the trunk of the car all day and that he needed to dispose of it. We should also be clear that all the witnesses that implicated Buddy's guilt were all allegedly involved, correct? Yes. There, were, there was no... Involved in this... In, in the prostitution mm-hmm. ring and potentially the murder. Yeah. So that that's an interesting thing to note, that everybody... Because a lot of people, and we should probably put this out here... And this is why, like, everybody was just in utter disbelief. A lot of people didn't believe that Buddy could do it for a number of reasons. One, they didn't think that he was that type of person. Two, the manner in which Christiana was killed does not look like something that a man of his size would have to do. It sounded like a smaller person Mm -hmm. or multiple small people had to do. So, um, to refresh other people on on how Christiana was killed, she was beaten the head, and held under a bathtub to drown her, to finish her off. Basically, they had taken her head, smashed it off the tub. Mm -hmm. The bathtub was filled. She was placed, and then somebody or somebody's sat on her and submerged her so she drowned. Now, usually, and again, like, I I don't have data to back this up, and I hope all y'all in the comment sections give your thoughts on this as well, but from my experience from reading up in cases like this, when a much bigger man kills a much younger woman, it's usually strangulation. It's the, it's the three S's. So it's like strangulation, stabbing, and shooting mm-hmm. is usually what it is. And this does not fit into that. Right. So for those who, who don't really know much about Buddy, Buddy was a veteran from war in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. He was well over six feet tall. He was humongous. He must have been 6'3", 250. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, just, he, he towered over me. And the other thing is, the other thing is, is that when you shake, when you shake a man's hand, it's like this thing that dudes do. It's a, it's a little strength test. Real. Yeah, they, they give it a little squeeze. Yeah. And he was mass. He was extremely strong, dude. Yes. Mm-hmm. Extremely I, strong individual. I shook yes. his hand. I remember that. He, he could pick me up with one arm. Christiana, on the other hand, just like he was big. Mm-hmm. Christiana was very petite, very, very skinny, like 98 pounds type skinny almost. Yeah, she was really little. So, the, the you were, so what you're saying, go, go ahead, go ahead. So, so just the the manner of death, the kind of struggle that was there doesn't like comport to somebody there, his size. There was too much of a struggle for somebody that could have easily, oh, not just overpowered her, but could have overpowered like two or three of her yeah. at once. 
it doesn't make sense. That's, if, that, that's if you thing. and I, if you and I decided we were going to take Buddy down, mm-hmm. you and I would have serious problems accomplishing that feat. Absolutely, absolutely. Like so, so there's he's no an extremely strong, very big guy. Yeah, and I don't mean this with any disrespect to Christiana, but she would have been no match for him to even put up a struggle. The only thing that I could say is that I have seen people when they believe that their life is on the line and do amazing feats of strength. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they do things that you would not believe. I mean, we've all heard about the mom who picks up the car and all the rest yeah. of it because her kid's under yeah. there. So I understood that part of it as far as, like, people were doubting it. I mean, in my mind, nobody can convince me otherwise. I think that there was probably somebody else involved, but this person had... The only reason I'm not coming out and saying it is because I don't want to come out on the internet. I'm not worried about anything legally. Mm -hmm. I'm just, for me, my own personal character, like, I don't want to come out and say this person's name... And they could be innocent. There's a 2% chance. That's up to God. But from my vantage point, for me, and I don't know if this is where you guys are going, to me, I don't, I'm not certain. I don't believe that he did that by himself. I don't believe that the head injuries, et cetera, were, were, were inflicted by him alone. Mm-hmm. I think there was somebody else. Because she was quitting, right? Wasn't that the story where she was going to quit the, 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 yes. the work? Yes, she so was. She was already done let's with talk it. Talk about that. Yeah. So basically, she had had enough of Brandy. From from what I hear, is Brandy wasn't even giving her her money. And which is what? Just so you guys know, if you're considering sex work, like I have no judgments for you. I can tell you though, I've I've worked with a lot of folks in that industry, and I'm telling you, an honest manager or a pimp who's going to give you your cuts consistently is a pipe dream. They don't operate that way. Yeah. That's how they make their profits. They'll do it initially to get you in, but once you're in and you're hooked on some drug or whatever, they're not giving you your money, bro. I'm just telling you the truth. Mm-hmm. But go ahead. Yeah, so from what I understand, Brandy wasn't giving her her money, and she was essentially squatting in the downstairs apartments that they kind of... Like, Brandy supposedly had this duplex, but I don't know if she owned it, Rumors were that the actual landlord had abandoned it because it was getting foreclosed upon. So she was living downstairs and she had had enough of Brandy and left. So she was returning. What do you mean she had enough of Brandy? Just her overall Her overall personality? Like, personality. They had gotten into a fight down in Foxwoods at one point. Or in Boston. It was in Boston. Her and Brandy? Yeah, had gotten into a physical altercation. And she wasn't getting the money on top of that. Yeah, and she wasn't getting the money. So she had basically had enough with her. So she I got to a physical altercation. Yeah, maybe? supposedly Christiana bit her. So here's the, to answer your question earlier, because you, you kind of asked, you know, what what do we think about Buddy? I, I think the the real question is, um, and this was a question in a lot of people's mm-hmm. minds, not that was he involved or was he not. It's like, did he do the murder right. or did he just dispose of the body or was there something in between? Did he do the murder with the help of somebody else? Mm-hmm. Was he just disposing the body? That's that's so the part that here's, people aren't sure about. Here's the part that like makes me really confused about this. So when this all went down, this is actually what almost got me fired. When all this was going down and he had been arrested, I went and checked his time clock for the day. And I swear like 99% in my head, it said that he had clocked in at 8 in the morning. Now, according to the affidavits, both of them, so both of them that are readily available on the internet, Christiana went over to the house over on Highland Avenue at 7.30 in the morning. So if that were the case, there'd be no way for him to murder someone, clean up the scene, hide the body, and then for Brandy and Alonda, who were there initially, to come back and everything be cleaned up. It wouldn't be possible. Now, in one of the affidavits, it claims that he had punched in to work at 1130 in the morning. But that's not what your time record But that's record not showed. what my time record showed. From and ours what, were digital, right? Right. From what I understand was he had done a split shift that day. We were really, really understaffed. So we would have people come in, work in the morning, leave for like an hour or two for lunch and then come back and finish their shift off. And he did this a lot for me. He yeah. sometimes wouldn't even like, you know, take an extended lunch. He just like work the, you know, eight in the morning to 8 PM for me because 
he would do that for me. Now, one of the affidavits, the 16-pager, claims that he had clocked in at 11.30, and I just don't recall that because I took a screenshot of this and sent it to his lawyer. And it was yeah. like, there's no way, there's no yeah. way. And, and that almost got me fired. Because then he started asking for, like, this wasn't a, a lawyer did. Yeah, this was not a very good lawyer, but he hired, like, a family law lawyer to defend him. He came yeah. back and wanted me to provide video. So then I had to tell my ops manager what I did. Now, I've been in touch with this lawyer recently. I wrote to him because I wanted confirmation to see if he had records. He won't talk to me. He didn't even respond Did to not you. even respond. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, he... So, what is... So, she... So, she and Christiana and, and Brady are not getting along. She won't give her money. At some point... This is what I heard when I was down in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Christiana says, I'm out. Mm-hmm. And Brandy says, okay, come get your stuff. Mm-hmm. So she goes to the apartment. And the story that I heard is that Buddy intercepted, is that Brandy sent Buddy to go kill her or convince her to stay because she was a moneymaker or whatever. So from what I heard is basically why she was at the house wasn't necessarily to get the stuff to begin with. She was borrowing the Lexus to go Christiana to was. yeah it was borrowing the lexus because she didn't have a car because she was driving to a family reunion up in in rangeley which she didn't show up for. which she didn't show up for and that was the whole reason she was going to the house initially it wasn't necessarily to get her belongings that was wow. just kind of a byproduct of that because she had some stuff there still so it was to get the car so she goes to her family yeah jesus but here's the other thing that should be mentioned is that the motive that they attributed to Buddy for killing Christiana didn't seem to fit because a lot of us thought, oh, he must be a part of this prostitution ring. But from what you told me, he had nothing to do with it. No, he didn't. He just kind of existed and let Brandy do her thing, but he wasn't recruiting girls. He wasn't wrangling new patrons. He wasn't he, getting he wasn't, a cut, clearly. And he wasn't getting a cut. So, like, you never saw him flash money or, or buy extravagant no. things or anything like well, that? Yeah, uh, I, it would be very hard for me to conceive of Buddy being able to even recruit the girls. Yeah. He just didn't have that kind of gift. Like, no. Levi did. Mm-hmm. Levi did, but Buddy was kind of he awkward. Rough. He had kind of a dumb charm to him. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah, like, yeah, people he, liked him because he was goofy. The big dumb guy. Yeah. But the, kind of like a Gronkowski type yeah. character. Yeah. He was like, like the big dumb guy with the heart of gold, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the prosecution was trying to run the motive of jealousy, mm-hmm. correct? But they couldn't really yeah. justify why he was jealous of Christiana. Right. So some would, were saying that Christiana hit Michael, who was Brandy's son, and that's why he did it. Another angle they had was claiming that Christiana had given out Brandy's full legal name to a client or disclosed what type of business was being conducted well obviously that client knows what type of business is being conducted there right. that was like another weird angle uh, that was one that i heard i don't know if that was brought up in court but what was said on the call floor is that she was going to roll uh to government officials or to you know somebody in law enforcement about the prostitution ring mm-hmm. especially since there was rumors that they were servicing people high up in main state government yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, some of the names that got listed were pretty significant. I'll say this: if it ever actually got out and the connections were made, it would get it would get national news. Yes, yes, it would. Yes, it would. I, I'd say 100%. that it would mm-hmm. get it would get national news, especially maybe international. Yeah, yeah, potentially. yeah, potentially. yeah, yeah, one hundred percent national. That's yeah. as, that's as much as I'll say about that. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, my, my understanding was always that she was going to leave and she was a massive moneymaker and that Brandy sent Buddy to intimidate her and that he took it too far and killed her on accident. Um, that was, that was kind of the picture that I had. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I said, I have other suspicions that obviously I'm not going to say on camera, but I do believe that there was another female there that would explain how brutal that fight was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and because it doesn't make sense how it went down. Because I'm telling you, a fight between me and Buddy would not be very 
There wouldn't be a lot of fireworks. It would be over very quickly. You see what I'm saying? I'm a grown man. Like, Christiana doesn't stand a chance. I, I, I cannot tell you guys how thin and just... Mm-hmm. She was also just a soft person. Mm-hmm. And Buddy was big and hard. He was a, he was a hard... I mean, he was a warrior. I mean, he literally... He, he saw been shot in the back. He was in, he was in Afghanistan. He, got yeah. hit, he, he had a purple heart, didn't he? Yeah. I, mean, I believe dude, so. I mean, like, he showed me his, like, bullet wound. Yeah, like, he's a, he's a gangster. Like, he's a real... Like, he's... This is not... Yeah. So, like, that that altercation and the way they described the apartment or whatever, it sounded like it was some drag-out thing, which, again, is possible with a person possible. with that disparity because if you know you're fighting for your life... Um, I don't think Buddy had any wounds on him either. That's from the thing. You'd have, you'd have hella you'd defensive, defensive wounds. wounds yeah. On the arms, especially. You'd, and you'd have a lot on the uh, face. Yeah. So, but when you saw him, after There's that, nothing that, like that happened, on him. you didn't see any difference mm-hmm. on him. He's nope. clear as he would have had something. Uh, I do believe he was involved, but I also think that there was a female involved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just think that this this girl was so intelligent that she 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 was able to convince Buddy to just take the entire rap himself. Yeah. Because I think the logic was, look, they've already got their eye on you. They're going to go after you. You're going to lose anyway. Why should both of us go down? Plus, you know, if the person was related to him, they could pull on those heartstrings too. That's what I think happened. I mean, we'll never know, but all I know is that I remember where I was when the whole thing came out, and I remember it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, I was reading out of Dave Pitt, and I was hearing about her being submerged under there like that, and I was just like, wow, this is a person like we work with every single yeah. day. Like, I don't... You know, I don't understand that. But if Brandy thought she was going away for a long time, like, I definitely... Well, well here's the question I have for you, Yergi, is um, up until that point, what was the relationship between Brandy and Buddy that you know of? It was fine. So here's the really interesting thing um, about all of that. So up until I started doing research for us recording the episode, there were things I didn't know because I hadn't read the 16-page affidavit. Yeah. You read it recently. I read it recently. I had found the smaller one online, and I thought that was all of the information. So, you know, Buddy gets arrested. I'm going to visit him in county jail every week. I went to see him. I remember that. I went to see him every week. I put money on his books. He would call me. It was very expensive. Very expensive. And for the first several visits, it was me, and it was that receptionist, and it was Brandy. We would drive down in the Cadillac SUV together down to the um, the jail in Cumberland County. Brandy wasn't allowed in. So it would always be me and the receptionist going to visit him. Why wasn't Brandy allowed in? Because she was part of the investigation. Okay, well, I what I didn't know, and this was the interesting part, is Brandy's the one who rolled on him. And had already rolled on him at that point, but you didn't know that. No, she was playing it off to us like... She didn't know what happened. She was going to talk to the lawyer. Um, we'll try to get some answers. All of us thought that someone else had you know, said something or they had found something. No, it was completely 100% her. And she was playing it off like she had no idea and she was going to help him out. But really, she wasn't allowed to go in there because she's the one who rolled. And wasn't the only one to roll on him either, correct? Right. I believe, obviously, probably Le- Levi was part of it. But in the affidavit, she's the one who made the appointment to go talk with like the Lewiston police detectives. Yeah, it's all in there. Yeah. She completely completely sent that dude out the drive. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't feel sorry for him for obvious reasons, but yeah. at the same time, it's like that's your that's your brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like but out of the affidavit, she was in the car when they took her up, right? Because he so so after she's dead she was in the dude. She was in dude's trunk for like a day. Because um, this yeah, thing right it was here, almost all day. I'm looking at this thing right here, and it's saying Levi's claiming that he was in, you know, their room, and that he heard Brandy and uh, Buddy talking in the other room. Right. He's at 36 Highland Avenue when he says um, she's been in there all day. I need to get it done. Yeah. So basically what had happened was supposedly this happened around 7, 30, 8 o'clock in the morning. Buddy worked with me all day. And then 
they went to pick him up at 8 o'clock at night because they were running up to press style to go get some of his belongings, which I thought was a really, really strange trip. Like, why are you leaving at 8 at night to go do that? It's a five-hour drive. Well, apparently they went home, and before they had even left, Buddy disposed of her body down in Lisbon. Near a place called the Left Hand Club. There's some right. trails off near there. Um, it's strange that they didn't. You would think going to Presque Isle, that was where they would have disposed of the body. It's a more remote location. Mm -hmm. It's further from the area. The fact that it was disposed of in Lisbon seems so last minute, so ill thought out, so sloppy. And I just kind of wonder why there, of all places. Well, they wouldn't have found her. Well, they wouldn't have. He, until, yeah, he, he was part of disposing her body. Yes. He transported her body. Yes. And assisted in disposing of her body. And, and here's how we know that for sure, that he wasn't set up on that, because at sentencing, when he was found guilty, he immediately motioned to give up the body for a reduced sentence. Yep. And they would So we not, know that's 100%. Yeah, they convicted him on basically a thin motive and no body. But when, when they read him as guilty, he immediately gave up the location of the body. And if he hadn't done that, uh, she well, probably was, never would have been. Yeah, there. it was a couple months later. So he he got the guilty verdict. I believe it was in like October. It was around Christmas time, we'll call it, mm -hmm. when they finally found her. Is that ex like how long after when he gave up the location? Was it immediate or did he? It was it was immediate after okay. they, that they found her. They went and found her immediately, and then he was sentenced he like six months Lisbon? later. Yeah, she was in Lisbon. Timestamp. How did they convict him without a body? I thought it's very mm. difficult without a body. Be because they had several people uh, who perjured themselves testify um, to put him away in return for immunity. Mm -hmm. Like all of them were given immunity. Levi, um, uh, Brandy, Brandy, Yolanda. They, they were all given uh, immunity on the prostitution charges and on accessory murder. Oh yep. Yeah. Because and technically. Technically, because the fact that the prostitution business was happening, because you're doing, I believe, I don't know if it's considered a felony, but when you're, when well, a, it is felonious. It is felonious. So when a felony is committed and then a murder happens, everyone now becomes a murderer. Yeah. Um, so since this is off, we're off camera right now. Technically, tell me the timestamp. It's all at one thirty. So I'll look for you at one thirty. So my assumption is that because the prostitution ring was servicing uh, high-profile clients, that uh, they didn't want that to get out. So they figured, if hey, we'll just all you all rule on this person, and you you all can go away, and you won't get charged on the prostitution ring. Wow! Because if they're charged on the prostitution ring, then the name gets out. Makes news and I always knew because because I would see like because I came back to me after and I saw Levi at Walmart, and I'm just like, yo, I wanted to. It, the thing that gets me about him, he just walks around like everything's cool. Mm -hmm. like, everything's, like he didn't, like I don't think. I mean, me personally, what I think happened is that he, her, and Brandy got in some altercation, some fight. Yeah. And Brandy slammed her head against the thing or whatever. Yeah. And then. Yeah, I think Brandy did it, and Buddy cleaned I, it up. I'm damn certain that it was her. Yeah. The drowning thing, I'm not sure about, but I'm pretty certain it was her. And and he, she is smart and manipulative enough. Because so, did you see the affidavit where he said, you know, I'm a soldier, they're not going to... Mm -hmm. He basically said because he served time, you know, in Iraq, Afghanistan, that nothing's going to happen. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like something your sister would tell you. Mm -hmm. For your silly ass to go and, and cop the plea. Yeah. But he's being a good... Because they're twins. That's the other... We should probably mention yeah, that. Yeah, they are twins. They're twins. So I'm certain that she did that shit, but then they got such a bond that she was able to just completely yeah. manipulate mm -hmm. yeah, and that. got got him to confess it because I do think he participated in it so the logic would be hey you're going down why should both of us go down I mean I got a kid you've been watching little Michael you're gonna leave little Michael without a mom like I'm certain that that's what happened yeah, yeah. That's my how long is he for I don't uh, uh, he's 55 years yeah. without possibility of parole I don't know about that I mean in those situations man they just want a head bro they just just give us a head so we can say, here, here you go. Yeah, at yeah. 55 years, I don't think he's getting parole. They're not trying to find anybody. I, yeah. I mean, especially around here, since murders don't happen in Maine that often, what they want to do is, okay, let's get the guy. Yep. We'll villainize him, and yep. then we'll put him behind bars. You're all safe. This doesn't yep. happen here, because when it happens, we take care of it quickly. Like, they just want open and shut cases. Yeah. So you all feel safe. Yeah. So, when you found out that she was dead, when, when did you think that she was dead? 
I, I didn't think she was dead. Buddy had told me that she had possibly taken out, like, taken off out west to do porn. And that wasn't the first time that had been mentioned about yes. her either. It wasn't just Buddy saying that either. I had heard people say who who knew her that that's mm-hmm. what they thought that she did. So too. a that former she was, that she, she she wasn't missing. She just went to L.A. or something yeah. to Cause do porn. Because apparently she had told people before that she wanted to break into the porn business. Right. So a certain supervisor who used to have fun parties at Denny's. Okay. Gave me that same information as well. The big dude? Really? The big dude with the hat. With, with the, the Viking? With the Viking? Yeah. Wow. That she had told him the same thing. Okay. So you guys, so this, so what you guys heard was she's not really missing. She just left, and obviously she's not going to tell her family. I'm going to my latest shoot porn. Mm-hmm. So that's what, so, so when did you, so when you found out she was dead, did that make you question Buddy at all? Or? So no, I immediately thought it was Brandy. I'm like, there's no way, there's no way. And that made me extremely unpopular at work. Very yes. unpopular. I do. I remember that entire situation, and yes. I remember at the time, my mindset was, come, it, it was funny. This mm-hmm. is a reiteration of what happened last year with Richard and all the rest of it. So I was furious at Buddy, but in reality, I wasn't mad at anybody but myself for obvious mm-hmm. reasons. Um, but I was really, really angry about that. People, people would come to me like, Yo, you know, Jess is yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm not. Ta- I don't want to hear about it. I was just so angry at Buddy mm-hmm. that. And the other thing, too, was I wasn't working there anymore. So I had that assignment in Lexington, and then I came back, and then I left again. I mean, I was all over the place. So I was, like, in and out. But I do remember that segment when you were you were almost, like, advocating for him a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So, like, like I said, I was putting money on his books. I was going to visit him. I was sending magazines for him to read. I was... Um, did totally. he ever say I didn't do this? Yeah, he maintains his innocence, a hundred percent, still to this day. But he won't say who, and he, he doesn't have an opinion on who he thinks did it. Well, he can't talk about it because he's currently appealing it, correct? Right. Yeah. But or he or did. He did, see, he did to later. Trial. When in the uh, right. initial trial, mm-hmm. he tried to, or his lawyer, who's a very flimsy lawyer, tried to then present Brandy as an alternate suspect. It was kind of too little. It too late. was too little, too late. They already had cut the deals with her, and they're like, you know, she's no murderer, even though she's a pathological liar. Mm-hmm. That, so, that, uh, those were that girl is a sociopath. Yeah, yeah that was she, almost a direct quote. She is a sociopath, that girl. Yeah. She has zero conscience whatsoever, but she's very good at crafting all of these very elaborate, like, half the stuff she told I found out later, half the stuff she told me in the interview was all a lie. Mm-hmm. Wow. But it was like, me- of course, everybody lies in interviews, but they were like very intricate lies. But it- <laughs> so I was just like, wow, man, like she's, it's really interesting because I had one view of this entire situation until this discussion. But, um, so when you found out that she was actually really, truly dead, your your instinct was? I, I was still protecting him. Somebody else now, how do you feel about that now in retrospect? So I have a really hard time with it because once he actually gave up the location of her body, yeah. then I felt a completely different way. I felt completely, you know, lied to, basically. Because, like, why would you know the location of her body? Why didn't you do it sooner? Why didn't you speak up? And, and you stood up for him in the face of, you know, basically abuse. I mean, not just... Were there rumors that you and him had a thing going on on the call for? But even the what the DEA, what, not the DEA, the, the DA mm-hmm. went after you and tried to press. Oh yeah, he's seeing other girls. Like he's not just seeing you. Like, so there was like a rumor that we were seeing each other, and we totally were not seeing each other that one? at all. So basically, I was just in his corner because I thought a serious like injustice was happening, and like I tried to rally like my whole team around the fact that he was locked up for no reason. Which, in hindsight, is a terrible thing to do. I should have never, ever involved people in that whatsoever. Was this before or after he... This is when he was initially arrested. He the bot. Okay. Yeah. So, like, after the fact, I felt completely lied to. I feel, like, made a fool of. I realized I had pissed a lot of people off. Like, people who were close to me were, like, completely angry with me. Yeah. Um, and I pushed a lot of people away. But how much of that 
would you really have done differently if you, if you, if I started with the, so you and I work together. Mm -hmm. I hear some craziness about you. You're being accused of whatever. Yeah. I come to you and I'm like, Jess, we've had our wars level with me. You know, I'll buy you a pizza, whatever we used to do, you know, back in the day. We, I used to send somebody to, was it El Hop? We'd send people to El Hop yeah. to get pizzas. I, I, I'd say, all right, Jess, let's have a pizza and tell me, like, did you really kill this girl or what? Mm -hmm. If you would have told me, nope, I didn't do it, I would ride for you. Like, even if you knew, I would ride for you to, to, to the end of it. Because I'd just be like, yo, this is my friend. I've worked with her. She's never shown any of this. Now, if you showed, like, there, there's a young lady that I mentioned, okay, earlier that I worked with. Now, if somebody came out with her where she murdered somebody, I wouldn't defend her. I, I love her, but I believe she's capable of that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But you, I would be, I would be, I would be going after everybody. I, the, the, the DA would be calling me. I'd be calling them. Like, I'd be, right. So, like, I understand why you would do that. Mm -hmm. My question is, do you believe he's involved at, at all? It, let me ask this question. Do you believe that he could have prevented her from dying? Yes. Okay. So, from that vantage point, I could see how you would regret defending him. But not preventing someone from dying and being a murderer are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's like really, really hard because if you if we go back to the, you know, should have I reported the prostitution ring? Should have I like not babysat Michael at my desk? He would have no longer been at ACS anymore. And a lot of the things that, you know, went on, yeah. still you know, could have happened. I mean, it actually still could have happened because no one was working there they anymore. All would, they all would have happened. Right, it could have even accelerated the process. It all would have happened. You probably elongated her life, actually. The fact that he had a place to, because another thing is when people don't have work and don't have people who are accountable, it's actually easier for them to do bad stuff because exactly. there's nobody to disappoint. So... Um, and, and a lot less to lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like, even even when when you have a job, even a job you don't need, you still don't want to get fired. Right. So, to me, your involvement probably elongated, you know, her, her life and gave her a shot. I understand defending the person, mm -hmm. and I I don't think that I'm glad that we had got to have this conversation because my vantage point of the whole situation was. This dude was a murderer. It was an open and shut case, and Jess has some weird fascination with murderers. And now she's one of these people that's that's. Uh, so that was like the the narrative. And I'm very glad that we had this conversation because yeah. that's not what's happening. Right. That was. This is you work with a person, and you love the people that you work with. You just yeah. do. You just you love them or you hate them, but you do you do love the people that you mm -hmm. work with, and so. You're trying to be loyal and, 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 and help somebody who's in a lot of legal trouble. And uh, the guy's entire character, it's you against the world. Like, I completely understand mm -hmm. it now. I'm glad that we had this conversation just for that. Because I, right. really, I was really hurt by the way that you were. Because it made me feel like... Because when the, the other situation happened with Donna, there was a particular person who in my mind, was an enabler of this person. Mm -hmm. Even after it came out that he was... Like, that did not change her perspective, and she didn't look at all heartbroken over the death of this mm -hmm. person. So when you were relating to Buddy that way, I was like, get... I was like, oh, this is another, yeah. you know, person. So now I'm like, oh, no, this is completely different. If I was in that situation, I would have done exactly what you did, yeah. probably more. I went to the media. Yeah. Like... We, 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 were, we were going to get fired on the spot. There's media, like, right now in the parking lot. And, yeah. and we were told, like, if you even say one word to them, you're fired So I sort of did. When they had crisis right. service come in to talk to us, I'm like, the, the management won't let us talk to the media. They won't listen to us. And Buddy's locked up. We just want to help him. Yeah. That's basically, you know, what happened with all of it. And it was just, like, crazy. Like, the district attorney and the, like, lead investigator from the main state police kept trying to, like, get me to roll on him. And he's like, you know, there's there's other girls. He has all these girlfriends. I'm like, I don't care. I'm not his girlfriend. It's not well, like that. They're trying to get you jealous. to be jealous so that you would, you would, you would, you would, uh, 
added on to their narrative. So yeah. they, they basically lied to you, made up the story, thinking that it would make you jealous, so that way you'd spill what they know. No, sure there were girls yeah. talking to them, oh, and I didn't care. Us, yeah. But... But the, the local police do that here. We had a friend who was rehabilitating her life, made some mistakes, whatever. But she rehabbed her life. She got she got a job at Dunkin'. Mm-hmm. Across the street from her, just horrible luck. She ended up with this um, neighbor who was schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. This woman was paranoid. She believed that she heard some voice that our our friend had taken her stuff. So she calls the cops on, on our friend. Our friend works at Dunkin' Donuts. Police show up to Dunkin' Donuts, yell at this girl, accuse her. She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And the cop says, I'm going to be back here in 24 hours, and if you don't have all the stuff returned, I'm going to arrest you. So she calls me up saying, I'm going to get arrested, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what? Now, I know that that's against the law with that cop, did, but she doesn't know anything. So I go to the police station. So I rolled up to the police station. And I said, uh, I went to the front. I was like, yo, I need to talk to your man. I need to talk to Officer Porkchop, whatever his name is. And he's like, oh, he's off shift. He's like, what's this about? So I said, well, you know, I gave a brief explanation. And I said, I need to talk to him because I need to know who I need to mention. <laughs> so the guy takes me to the back room. And he basically says, yeah, that's my partner. We do that a lot. I know we shouldn't do that. Yada, yada, yada. He basically said, just look the other way to my friend. And I basically, I said, well, go out there and tell tell Sabrina that she's good because this this dude just terrified her on her first day of work. I'm like, you're lucky that I'm going to let this go, bro. But if it was a different circumstance, I would get at you. My point is, like, law enforcement in this particular state is not so much concerned about getting to the facts as much as it is they're concerned about being able to say, to your point, this doesn't happen in Maine. People don't mm-hmm. get assaulted and murdered in Maine. That doesn't yeah. happen. So when it does happen, they want that head, man. You want a head, and all of us, and you know, myself included, whether the person's guilty or innocent, if you can craft a very good story, go for it, man. So it, it's it's really interesting because it's so crazy. I was at ground zero, and there was so much information I didn't know. Mm-hmm. And we were right in the middle of it, and you didn't know the background on, on Buddy that I had, and vice versa. Yeah. And it's like, how people believe they can litigate things from thousands and thousands of ways is mind boggling to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Another like, in- bit of information as well that I don't know how true this is because it was information coming from Buddy, but I know the initial detective that was on the case. He used to be actually my landlord when I was a teenager, when my mom and I like rented this apartment together and rumor had it he had met his wife due to the fact that she was a sex worker and he had initially arrested her and he initially was one of the investigators on this case and apparently was really nice to buddy and them and buddy claims he was taken off the case because of how soft he was being on it i don't doubt it i don't doubt it yeah i don't doubt it so, uh, look, I'm not saying Buddy's innocent or guilty. I'm mm-hmm. not saying Brand- Brandy's innocent or, or guilty. What I'm saying is that these two stories are, they highlight some really interesting things about right. our society and our culture. One, just pure, unadulterated capitalism at times leads to things like, well, let's look the other way at, at, at this person. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, let's let's look at it because a lot of this came out of you know a desire to satisfy a very demanding client in this in this milieu that we're all in. And, mm-hmm. I, and I remember when you're a manager. I mean, they take you back there and, and they 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 explain to you how much money it is and and what you've done for families and and if you get this type of client, we give you this big of a contract. That means that you know. 5,000 people are going to be possibly affected by this contract. Right. So, so they know how to talk to you once they isolate what your value is. Like, money isn't necessarily a value for me, but they, you know, it's soft with, you know, people's families and such. So, that's how they communicated it. But at the end of the day, we were doing things and we did things as a company to increase our bottom line, but compromise who we were as, as people and as a company as as what we were supposed right. to do. I mean, I know personally, when I was managing my campaign, 
they had me interviewing people not even for my campaign all day long. I'd just be taking them everywhere. I ran out of room. Sometimes I'd take them to the smoke area to interview them. It was just insane. And I didn't care who I was hiring. And it was, it was a point was, is if they could talk, just hire them. Yeah, but see, that's not true. You did care. I did care. Because you had to manage those people. The problem is, is that we, I'm talking yeah. about the next level of management, made life such a living hell that it got to the point where we had good supervisors who were like, okay, I don't care anymore. Because she did care. Yeah. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been a top tier supervisor. The campaign that you were on was our premier campaign. It wasn't, I mean, they, they, they shot people down, they sat people down a bunch of times. So I'm not just saying it because it's, just, you know, Jess and I love her. I mean, that, she was just one of the best, but... It gets to the point where we can make your life so miserable that you just say, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. you want. And you in know? my campaign, there was such high turnover that I couldn't keep the seats filled. Yeah, that's bleeding now. Well, that's the other thing I wanted to mention. Like, in your defense, I'm sure some people are watching thinking, oh, well, she was just friends with Buddy. That's what this was about. Well, no, not only no. that, he was your ally. Yeah. The one person you could depend on out of the sea of Un, like people who weren't dependable, yeah. people who were and on I had drugs, some, yeah. people who were drunk on the floor, people who were selling on the floor. I know because I saw it. Mm-hmm. People who weren't doing their job and, and working for a campaign that was doing pretty immoral, uh, questionably illegal stuff. Yeah. And, I, so when you, I stress. and so when you have that one person that you can depend on out of all of that, that is just gold. Yeah. That is gold. Even on my campaign, having somebody that I could trust and depend on throughout the high turnover rate and throughout just all the sketchy stuff that was going on, having somebody to depend on just meant everything mm-hmm. in a place like that. People don't realize it's a brutal, brutal industry. Yeah. It, is. it was like it's me and Buddy and Larry. That was mm-hmm. like my people. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah, but it, it is a brutal, brutal environment. Because mm-hmm. here, here's the thing is that it, it, it's, it's kind of a similar effect to the internet comment section where people are are kind of anonymous so the things that they would never say to your face they can say online yeah well you're in an entire industry where people are talking to you over the phone so they believe they can talk to you however they want to talk to you so you get an agent that's that's ingesting eight hours of that you're supposed to manage this person and the person is underskilled underpaid Mm -hmm. right um it makes life a living hell for a supervisor. So if you can find, if you can find one person, that's why I, any, anytime I used to get new supervisors up, I'd always say, you got to find one true believer. Find one person that believes in you that is, is going to be an ally, stand them up and make sure that they get some, some press, right? Mm-hmm. So that people know like, okay, you've got allies, you're not by yourself. I used to say that all the time. Because I knew, like, emotionally, even at the mental health level, you need that at mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. Not even an official position, but you mentally need to be able to say, I can go over there, I'm going to hang out with Drew, and he's going to talk me off the ledge, I'm going to be okay. Like, you have to have that. So, for you to have that, that means that Buddy has done a lot for you emotionally, for mm-hmm. your own mental health, that people who are outside of the circle can't really understand. Yeah, it was it was absolutely insane. Like the the level of coaching that we were required to do, like surpassed anything I had to do and monitoring. And everyone was so angry all and, of the and time. That campaign, the metrics were insane. That campaign was the the weakest link of the entire building because what was we had two things going on right now. My campaign and your campaign. Mm-hmm. Both campaigns had to succeed. If one campaign failed, we lost them both. Our campaign was making a lot of money. Yours was not. Right. So because your campaign was failing or getting so close to failing, you had to succeed or mm-hmm. else you'd cost the, the company just so much money. Yeah. Potentially even close the site. That's what they were talking about or threatening with, mm-hmm. like if you were to lose it. So that's how important somebody like that was Yeah. because you had that much riding on you. Mm-hmm. Because if... We lost the campaign. Your job was gone. Yeah, I mean, and we did. My, I did lose the campaign. You're putting kids in their twenties. Mm-hmm. I was in my twenties. I think it was twenty three years old. I got brought into a meeting. They're like, "Look, the client's gonna pull away if we don't turn this around by this time. It's gone." Yeah. And I'm thinking about all my teammates. 
I'm thinking about, I'm not, I don't really care about corporate. I don't care if corporate makes money or not. Who yeah. cares? None of us cares about them. But I, you know, Donna mm-hmm. was alive at the time. She's got a, she's a pregnant woman with a kid. And I know she's the matriarch of her family. I got this guy over here. I got this kid over here, Zeph. He's 20 years old. He's just starting out in life. He needs he needs a job. So you're 20 years old, mm-hmm. carrying the, the lives and careers, I was, and, and and Jess had to do it. I had to do it. Like it's incredible pressure. People have no idea. The economy was, was terrible. Yeah. Like, so oh, yeah. many of my agents were a paycheck from the street, and I yeah. knew it. And we were hiring to fire. Yeah. yeah. And our ops manager didn't care about yeah. that, and so I had to go to bat to save what, them. Explain what hire to fire is. So we would have. Uh, new clients come on because we serviced a lot of different financial institutions. So if there was a certain promotion going on in that period of time, we needed to hire a lot more people to handle that call volume. However, we knew that call volume was not going to last forever. And so at that point, when the call volume is not there, we have people filling seats that aren't making us money. So they were hired purely to fire. And yeah, maybe we'd keep some of the very best but they were hired purely to get rid of later, but they would never tell them that. So you're, you're, you're not telling a person, hey, do you want the six-week job? And that's what they should have done. They that's what like, they hey, should have done. Do you, want, the, you want this temporary position or get temps? Yeah. But the economy was so bad at the time, and people right. were clamoring for jobs. And the other thing is, with temp agencies, you have to give them a cut. Mm-hmm. So when I was work, I worked as a temp initially, mm-hmm. and I... A regular perk should cost Lightbridge nine dollars an hour. I cost them fifteen dollars an hour because mm-hmm. they had to pay me, and the company had to get some profit. So I got cut immediately when the cuts happened. Mm-hmm. Regardless, mm-hmm. so to your point, we hired a lot. Of, we hire a lot of these people for a six week sort of hire fire trial, and then and then it's like. When you're a manager and you're on these calls and you're like, why is your p It's like, well, my, you know, my, your staffing is off. And they go, well, then fire them. And they just talk about it like it's just, mm-hmm. oh, just change that plant. And it's like, then you go, well, they didn't do anything like fireable. And then the answer is, find something. Like, I yeah. literally, that's literally what they told me. I should also mention the, the listeners at home because they might be in a state that's not at will employment. Here in Maine, we are an at will state. So you can be fired for whatever reason. They would have me sit and listen to people's calls just to find something fireable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you'll find something. And, you know, there's a difference. Like, you have somebody that, like, is a horrible person and you know they're about to Mm -hmm. go off on a customer. You will deploy somebody and say, find that so we can get rid of this guy before he takes that out on a customer and a client. Yeah. That's not the same thing as what we're talking about. What we're talking about is companies purposely hiring people to absorb a six-week bump. Mm-hmm. And then when you don't need them anymore, you get rid of them. All that to say, this is a situation that 20-year-old kids are being thrown yeah. into. So, this is like my first mm-hmm. major job. Yeah. Like, how, how do I balance this? Like, I was an acting supervisor. I was in charge of 21 people. It's yeah. like, what do you, knowing, like, all these people are on the line, you get to know them. You know they have families. You know they have kids. You know they're barely making it. Yeah. And that weighs on you. You know that you have responsibility in there. And honestly, you do have responsibility there. Yeah. So. so the other, th- I was on another side of that. So mm-hmm. when I first became a supervisor, there's 23 year old me. I'm then told that I have to, with someone from corporate, sell our program to a major world retailer. Yeah. So there's 23 year old me, brand new to this, sell our site to these people. Yeah. I'm like, completely like shaking at this point. It's all on you. All on me. I did it. I sold it. Then we had to ramp up two sites and that's when you came to us. Yeah. And I had to go immediately. Remember that? I Mm -hmm. had to go to North Carolina because they they underestimated what the volume was Mm going to be. It went for two two supervisors, me and one who was there before he left. Then I, 23 year old supervisor, have to hire supervisors. Oh yeah, that's right. When I jumped on, you were interviewing supervisors. Yes. Because our, our, our crew, we had nobody. It was just you. It was just me and yeah. our uh, <laughs> SDU manager that was in the Philippines. Yeah. And Shout out to the Albany. Yeah. The, the point is, like, that's the environment that, that we were in. And, and we were all, like, extremely young trying to navigate all this stuff. And, you know, we had Michael Scott. Shout out to the homie. Yeah. But, I mean, he was. And then after him, there really wasn't. They didn't. 
They filled it with this guy named Josh. Josh. Yeah. Okay, so well, let's let's back up and you know give Michael Scott you know his moment to shine a little yeah. bit because why he was fired I'm told was because he was fighting activity based compensation to be implemented. Is that correct? No. That's not correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, true. Okay. All he right. Was, he was ossified drunk on a call that we were doing for PML, oh. and that was the third time. Ooh. Okay. I also mind. heard a rumor he had a penchant for an agent on your campaign. He did. Yes. He did have a penchant for it, but it was mutual. Yes. Ooh, so, okay. Okay. So. Yeah, there, there were some defenders of him. It's like, yeah, he tried to not have ABC, so activity-based compensation. There was a lot of people there who were there for a long time making decent money, and then they reduced all of us down to minimum wage but you could make a little bit more depending on how your metrics were. It was it was the most probably immoral thing I've ever been a, well the second most. The first most immoral thing I've ever been a part of was when the agents figured out how to beat ABC mm -hmm. activity based compensation. Mm -hmm. Um they then changed the structure cuz they were making too much money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So initially it was sold as hey your thirteen dollars an hour has been holding you back. How about we put you at minimum wage and give you an unlimited earning potential? That was the unlimited. that was the argument. That was the argument. Of course, our agents, yeah, for the most part, we hired people if they had a pulse. But the agents that stayed in were you couldn't put anything by them, so you couldn't like sell them this nonsense. So I'd be there like giving it the old college try. To survive that environment, you're not a dummy. You know what so the score on is. our yeah. original campaign, we yeah. should be clear that we had some people who probably should have been retirees. 100%. So some that could have died on the floor because they were so old, who had worked piecemeal jobs Folk before. Did. Folk have died on the floor. Yeah. True story. Oh my gosh. Yeah, in, in the Bates I didn't know. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Two people, actually. Oh, my goodness. We'll have One, to talk about that offline. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Either. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, people literally dropped that. Yeah. So, yeah. go ahead. Continue. So, these people knew what piecemeal work was. They weren't about the bullshit that was trying to be sold to them. And, I mean, they were making pretty good money because they had been there forever. But they had been there for years. Right. Like, I'm like, talking like 15 years. Yeah, they like, were like in the telemark the days. Open. Yeah. So, yeah, they had a sweet schedule and they had a sweet mm -hmm. uh, pay scale, but they earned it. Right. Yep, 100%. And it was gone. We took it all away from them. Like, they were even making money that was, like, good for today's money. Yes. So the reason why that's relevant, guys, is that if we were paying Christiana maybe a livable wage, maybe she makes different decisions as to extracurricular work. You see right. what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. All of this stuff is connected. And at the time, she was working for the campaign that people argued paid the best Correct. out of the entire... And they were the most happy at. We, we should talk about, actually, um, when I started on your campaign, we, you were going to qualify for ABC, but only after 90 days. And yeah. so what do they do? They put you making minimum wage on the highest call volumes, so that way you eat that call volume, yep. so that way other people don't make ABC yeah. because all the people who are guaranteed to make minimum wage absorb that call volume. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it was just, you could tell that they sat back and, and, and planned that. And we were always the first people to hear about it mm -hmm. because the managers would always hide in the, in the, uh, in the, in the offices. We had to be on the floor telling everybody that. Mm -hmm. So I remember when we mm -hmm. changed ABC on our, on our project, because yeah. my folks, the people on my team, we were famous for having horrible attendance and amazing numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So ABC at the time was just about the numbers. It didn't factor in absenteeism. So our folks were making a killing. They were, especially when that new campaign had come in. Oh, yeah. The new card that we had to sell. Yeah. We were the... That's we were, when I came in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at sales. But we were killing. Then I get a call. I get brought into an office. We're changing it, and you have to roll it out and tell people mm -hmm. this is a good thing. And I'm like, two of my people quit immediately. Yeah. Two of my top mine, they said, you told us. They were yelling at me. I had a supervisor in my office saying, why are you allowing these people to yell at you? I'm like, because we're screwing these people. Yeah. 
I deserve it. They're like, you didn't make the policy. I'm like, I'm the I'm the touch point for it. They're right. going to yell at somebody. Yeah. It's better they yell at me than the agents because, quite frankly, we deserve it. I'm like, listen, you and I are salary. Mm-hmm. If they came at us with that bullshit, we'd be gone. Right. Well, I wouldn't be gone. There'd be a lawsuit. I'll tell you what, I'd be gone after the lawsuit. But you see what I'm saying? Like, right. My point is, all these factors, like, I mean, even factors into... Donna, Donna, the reason she left with, with Richard was because Richard has, was going to give her a deal on a car. Mm-hmm. And that's how he lured in. If Donna is in a in a, in a a center that's paying her a livable wage, maybe she, she already has a car. And she doesn't necessarily need a deal. Maybe she yeah. gets herself a nice Cadillac SUV. You know what I'm saying? Like, if she wasn't in that financially vulnerable situation then we might have been able to help her. It's the same thing with Christiana. You know what I'm saying? Right. So That's so all what it boils down the to. The policies that our company had on the front door as well as the back door all contributed to putting these girls in a, in a, in a vulnerable situation mm-hmm. that they shouldn't have been in, that they wouldn't have been in if they would have been compensated, in my mind, at a fair rate. So that's why I'm a big, you know, we talked about the fight for 15 you know, I'm a big fight for 1850 guy. Right. Like, we need to give people, especially, and I'm obviously biased towards this because I grew up with a single mother. Mm-hmm. And so there were times when we were at homeless shelter. From my vantage point, we, you know, single women in the workplace, there needs to be a lot more protections financially as well as otherwise mm-hmm. for single women in the workplace. Um, because it's it's a gap and i'm looking i'm like they're massively vulnerable and then when you put it in the social the socioeconomic context of lewiston which is the downtown area that full of people nobody cares about where the dirty loo it's just it's of course i'm surprised more of it didn't happen you know what i'm saying right um so for me it's like what are the lessons learned you know what i mean so in that situation it's like one is we've got financial vulnerability for uh, and then particularly women, you know, in, in our society. I understand it's 2021, but at the end of the day, we're not hearing a lot of stories about dudes getting kidnapped from work and then turning up dead. We're not hearing right. that. And then women are the kill. Like, that's not what's happening. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So for me, it's like we need to get really, really serious about, you know, the conversation around wages. Because I think wages, workplace wages have a lot to do with this. I really think if we had an 18 an hour, you know, which I know sounds a little bit, you know, idealistic or whatever, but I think Christiana's still here. I think Donna's still here. I yeah. really do. Well, well, 10 years ago, <laughs> we were making $9 an hour that uh, we could actually afford rent and groceries. Sure. Right? We could we could live off that. It was rough, but we still did it. Yeah. Now that $9 an hour, that's not going to do anything. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So, um, And, you know, it's a recipe to, to, to those two. Absolutely. And uh, I'm, ve- I'm just on a personal level... I'm, I'm glad that we had this conversation. Me too. Yeah. Because... Because that cleared a lot of stuff. It, do, it did. I don't want to, like, be misunderstood on it. I'm, like, not here. A lot of people seem to think that I hated Christiana. I had, you know, after I left ACS, I was over at the bank working, and someone approached me and said that they hated me because they knew that I was stating that I was happy that Christiana was dead, which never... I would never say anything like that. I wasn't happy she was dead. Yeah. So just the crazy stories that you know, occurred because I wanted to champion someone that I thought was innocent. Yeah, in reality, in reality, you were, you know, my, my scale of morality just has to do with what is, how much love did the person have when they were committing that action? Mm -hmm. That simplifies morality for me. I mean, your reaction to that entire situation was the most moral reaction out of all of us because if it's true that Buddy didn't do it or that he wasn't the sole participator, that means that Christiana didn't get complete justice. Right. And she right? didn't. So, so no the, matter the moral, how we look at it. The moral it. thing to do would be to, to look under every stone possible mm-hmm. to ensure that we could get some semblance of justice for this girl on, on this side. So you, I just want to like publicly apologize to you now I, you know how i get down i didn't really take part in a lot of the, the discussion mm-hmm. but the fact that we worked together for so long and i never actually went to you and actually engaged the discussion and say hey jess like this isn't you you know what i'm saying yeah because like i was like oh man like really 
Because you were, you, you know, I, I didn't, I was like, you were always like a compassionate person. Like, we had our disagreements, but I didn't really, you know, I didn't think that you had any hostility towards Christiana. But anyway, yeah, um, I'm glad that I can publicly say like, Dude, I'm sorry. And I can tell you this. A lot of the people that were upset by it, if they knew the real reason, would react the exact same way that I did. If they took the time to actually not listen to the rumor mill mm -hmm. and actually took the time to measure you by the character that you showed us over years, then I, I fully believe they would have reacted the same way. So when I, when I take that back and apologize, that's a lot of people. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, thank so, you. So, and... And and I, I I I'm glad that you that you did that, and I'm I'm very curious to see because I understand that the whole situation isn't over. So tough situation, man. But I, I gotta say, uh, it, this is horrible. It makes me a terrible person. No. But I'm very glad that you made it out of there, man. Me too. I'm glad you did as well. I'm glad we all did. Like, I'm glad wow. you made it out of there, and I'm glad you. I'm glad. I'm glad y'all. Are uh, you're together? You guys are, are doing good stuff. I'm very happy because I think about that place a lot. Me too. I think about that place a lot, and I think about those folks. And uh, there's people, there's people that work there that I'll love for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but the environment was just so freaking toxic, bro. It was such a terrible environment. Yeah. yeah. It's just so bad. So, I'm sure there's other things I should apologize to you both for. Being a manager in that place, holy moly, man, it was it, terrible. It was hard, like, especially to be a good manager, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. a lot of people cracked, a lot of people were selfish, but to be that good person, it was hard because the person above you didn't want you to be that good person because mm -hmm. I don't make money. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> but this probably isn't something we can have to go a whole lot into, but, I mean, after... It, they found out Christiana was murdered. The response on the floor, it wasn't like when Donna was murdered. Yeah. It, it, a lot of people thought it was hilarious. It was like, so strange. Yeah, they're like, oh yeah, of course, of course, another dead one. This is just what happens here. Yeah. It's also like everybody was just thought it was hilarious. Yeah. And I mean, already at this point, I mean, there were people who were selling drugs on the floor. It took a while to get them out. Yeah. Um, you know, there was people who got into fights. Like, there's just so much stuff. There's people having affairs, like, between the supervisor and agent level. Just everything was so mishandled and corrupted. Everybody knew it. That when they found out Christiana died, they just thought that was the icing on the cake. And, like, the jokes that were being made were gross. Yes, they like, were. Like, given her chosen profession, and so, that she had died... And that she was transported in a trunk. We, sh we should also mention that at that period of time, um, people were a lot more negative, viewed sex work a lot more yeah. negatively than they do yeah. nowadays. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and including the Sun Journal, our own local media made it a point when they talked about Christiana in the local media, they framed her as a prostitute. They may even oh. use the word hooker, I think. Yeah, I, yeah. The, I think, don't every, quote me on that. Every single... Every single article about her while she was missing, that's the first thing, they, before they even mentioned her freaking name, that's what they would talk about. And again, again, I don't want to frame this as, oh, they mentioned that she was a sex worker, blah, blah, blah. Look, if you're a sex worker, like, I have no judgments for you. All I'll say is stay safe. Holy shit. Stay safe. But what I will say is, there is a, a societal stigma around being mm -hmm. a sex worker. Mm -hmm. And they knew that. And they ran with it. And so, Jonna was not. She was a single mom who was pregnant, but she was going to be married, and that's how we want women to behave. Mm -hmm. So her death is, is a different kind of quality death than Christiana's death. That's a prostitute who yada, 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 yada. If you like, read the articles between both of them, yeah. the, the difference is just staggering in the yeah. way in which they frame both of them. There are so many articles about Donna that don't even mention that she worked at a call center. Mm -hmm. it, they don't mention, they don't say, uh, you know, uh, application processor, Donna Parent. They didn't say that. They talked about her. They talked about being her mom, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But with Christiana, immediately her profession went into play. Yeah, absolutely. And so that that really, like, it. the whole, actually, the whole, my inner, whole interaction with that organization really turned me off to capitalism, actually, is one of the things. I don't know. Maybe you're going to delete that. People get too political. But, like, 
this whole thing where like people we use people to make money instead of using money to make people right like and just this whole thing where I remember walking on the floor like everybody here is just a a, a dollar sign like I just imagine all these dollar signs and like the only reason they're important is because they're a dollar sign the only reason I'm important is because I'm a dollar sign and like I understood that and at the same time like I don't need my place of business to like embrace me as like a you know whatever but at least at minimum let's try to treat each other like human beings mm -hmm. right and that that comes out in how much we pay people it comes out in how long it takes to get a vacation it comes mm -hmm. out in paternity leave maternity leave it, it has a lot of implications you know um, because all these things conspire together to kill these two women in my opinion and at that level until we do something about that then we hold some level of culpability um, but we've we've got to be we've got to be different we got to change and we got to treat everybody with respect and if you're in one of those companies, start a YouTube channel. Get the hell out. Yeah. I, I don't want to be glib. Like, a lot of you guys are grinding. You guys are struggling. So, um, trust me. We know it. And, and it's killed some of you. We know that, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, leave. 100%. Please leave. 100%. Uh, one last thing that I, I wanted to ask you. I think we can both agree that uh, stricter background checks, uh, less lazy background checks, would have saved Donna Parody. Yeah. Would, they, would they have saved Christiana Fessmeyer, in your opinion? I think it would have. Do you? Well, Buddy actually was on probation because he had that's stopped true. an ex-girlfriend. But, but that's not a felony. But it would have shown up. So if we were taking what happened to Donna seriously and that came up at a background check... That should have blacklisted him. Well, okay. Uh, regarding Donna, Richard Dwyer had a prior violent offense that was yeah. felonious that he did prison time for. He had multiple. Multiple. Excuse me. Multiple. He did over a decade in prison. Yes, yeah. yes. Let's be clear about that. Like the dude For financial was, crime, too. But, right. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. You had mentioned that, too. But, like, that that's clear to me. Like, the background check would have gotten Dwyer and would have gotten him out of there. But Buddy... Buddies was a misdemeanor, the only, if I'm correct. The it only, was not violent. The, only, no, it wasn't. the, the major difference, mm -hmm. the background checks, in my mind, would have been Richard met Donna at work. Yes. Like, he would not have met her otherwise. Mm -hmm. Whereas Brandy, since Brandy and Levi were the main recruiters, then it's almost as if Christiana had no, ch she had no chance. Right. Because right. no matter how good our background checks were, we were never going to catch Brandy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And same with Levi. Yeah, he was already there. So, uh, so Christiana had no, there's nothing we could have done on the front door with her. I agree. Now, rehiring him, mm -hmm. obviously I have a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a serious problem with it. But again, Levi and and uh, and Brandy were there, so right. I, I just think with Christiana, unfortunately, there really there really isn't much any of our policies could have done to save her. I agree with that because I agree, yeah, because I agree now. In that the framework. meeting the meeting wasn't necessitated by work, whereas the other one it was. And like I didn't really put that together until this conversation because myself and a lot of people um, since. Clearly, Donna's murder had a huge fault uh, owed to it by ACS. When somebody else died that had worked there or was related to people that work here, instantly we're like, yep, call center's at it again. And already we, we thought so little of the place with everything going on that we're just like, oh, yep, yeah, it had to have been yeah. their fault again. But in this case, I cannot see a scenario where any hiring process would have saved her life, unfortunate as that is. And it, it's hard when it gets to the point where having another murder at your place of business doesn't seem too weird to you. And that's what I was saying. Like, see, that's see, I, I I'm gonna be a little bit easier on people, just in the sense that I wonder how much of that was a defense mechanism. I, I was that's what I, I think was that's say. I think that's what I it was because the second time you're in disbelief, you're almost laughing it, you're laughing about it. 
because you can't even believe that at this place just so much bad is happening. Now mm-hmm. your second murder in a place where nobody gets murdered. Yeah. Like that that is so hard to process and comprehend. Well, I mean, during nine eleven, right? Mm-hmm. I remember because I watched the entire thing unfold. The first plane hits and you're like, damn, bro, that's terrible. But the second plane hits, and you knew immediately a bunch of things. One, we're under attack. Yep. Two, that was purposeful. Mm-hmm. Three, it's most likely going to happen again. Mm-hmm. So when the second plane hit, everybody in the room was, the mood changed like that. Initially, it was like, yeah, that guy, you can't tell, didn't have directions. You can't tell directions. It was like a big joke. Oh, this guy crashed into a building. But the second crash, everything stopped immediately. Yeah. And then after, then people started saying, wait a second, it's not over. <laughs> what about us? What if it happens to, what if somebody attacks Maine? What if somebody attacks Florida? Mm-hmm. Nobody knew. And I think that's the effect that the second murder had. It was, this happened again. Our leadership is completely inept. They cannot protect us. Mm-hmm. So let's just, this is almost like gallows humor, like laughing on their way to the electric chair. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of the, 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 I mean, I'll share personal story this is kind of weird um my and you guys can decide to put it or not but essentially uh my ex the way she decided that she was done with our family was to call a family meeting because everybody called family meeting and then she she proceeded to tell everybody i'm leaving like i'm out the kids are like what's my she's like yeah i'm out and so of course two of my kids were like ah Mm -hmm. and my oldest is actually pretty heartbreaking because i knew what he was doing he said, this is good. We won't have to worry about insurance. This is good. I'm glad. And, you know, he starts you rationalizing, know, mm-hmm. rationalizing it and, 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 and smiling and all this. And I was like, okay, he's going to have the worst time. And sure enough, he had the worst time. The one that cried about it immediately, she was the most well-adjusted. But him, he, it took us a, a good two or three years to get him. He's just now recovered. So... My point is, is that it might be that the people that were making the most jokes were actually the most affected by it, actually. Yeah. But defense mechanism-wise, your parents or the people above you that are mm-hmm. supposed to be taking care of you are completely clueless and cannot protect you and will not protect you unless there's some financial stake in it. If you get found missing, the only thing they're going to worry about is the optics. How does it look on the outside? Right. You know? When we sh- when 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 Christiana went missing. And we had the corporate whatever come up. The big thing was the big primer wasn't look for her. What was the what was the last thing you heard from her? What was the last text? That wasn't the big thing. The big thing was don't talk to anyone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't even talk to your family. Like what the hell? Like are we yeah. in the CIA when you don't I, talk I, to my if, family? If we catch you talking about it on the call for instant termination. Yep. Yep. We yep. And, and you're and don't think we're not looking at your Facebook. I'm like, wait, is, wait, what? And they were looking at our Facebook. Yep. And, and they would, they, they would, they would, they were dead ass. They would fire you, bro. Yep. Like, yep. period. So it's like that. The, the emphasis wasn't trying to find her, or even okay. So she's dead. Let's look at some safety measures or whatever, or whatever. It was mm-hmm. just don't talk to anybody. Protect the <laughs> yeah. image. You talk to so so now the message is okay, Jess. So if you get found mi- missing, guess what? We're gonna have a nice meeting, mm-hmm. and all we're gonna do is tell people not to talk about you. Anyone who was there Basically, for yeah. any de- anyone who was there for any decent amount of time knew what was going on, and already so many people felt insecure there. They felt insecure about like, am I going to get my next paycheck? Like, am I going to have a job in a couple weeks? You know, already there's a stigma that you're from Lewiston, you don't matter, you're scum. We know that. Yeah. And now on top of that, we could get murdered, and it doesn't matter if we yeah, get murdered. It doesn't matter. Like, you don't feel secure in any single point of your life yeah how does that feel yeah how must that feel it's insane yeah mm-hmm. and i can't imagine i can't imagine being a woman in that situation exactly you know what i'm saying because to me i never once worried about i never once worried about like oh somebody was killed that could happen to you like it never even crossed my mind like anything could happen to me mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying i was too young to comprehend it yeah and even worse, I thought, this must happen everywhere. This must be normal. This must be how a workplace is. Like, yeah. I, I was just so, I would, this was literally my first major job. Out of I, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. getting these people at really impressionable ages, man. Mm-hmm. So I, I just remember, and I, it didn't click until all the girls started coming to my office saying, hey, can you walk me here? And, and what about, you know, there was a trans individual and 
you know, they were not being read as a female. So you had a bunch of girls that were terrified because this Christiana situation just happened. They look up, they see somebody they perceive to be male in the bathroom. And so they're like, there's no safety here. Mm -hmm. Like we have no, you can't protect us. You can't do anything. And I, I just remember like being at the point where I had to admit like, well, I can't protect y'all from everything. Like I can walk you to your car, but I had to like, no, you can't protect anybody, bro. Like you, you one dude, bro. Like, it was it was very 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 hard time, and I'm very glad that you know, you guys you guys made it out. Like we're talking about it like it's a like it's Chicago or something like that. But it was you had to be there to experience. Yeah. It was a uniquely yeah. This isn't an exaggeration at uniquely all. Toxic this is this is not an exaggeration. To make it out of there meant something because there was a, for people who left because at the time that was like one of the only places you could work that paid a decent Above decent wage, wage. Mm -hmm. that wasn't manual labor yeah. so there was this curse if you left acs you would end up back there one way or another and i and, did and that's what happened mm -hmm. and people would go to this other job they they thought they were turning over a new leaf new chapter of their life something would happen and they'd have to come crawling right back, and the beast would just take them that, back in. And it would this keep is where you, you belong. It would keep you in a state of poverty as well, because after you got there and you were there for an extended period of time, prices for everything were rising around you. Rent was going up, you know, food was going up, it was getting expensive. And even me working as a manager, I couldn't get out because the next best place to work was where I am now. And at the time they had an extremely strict dress code and I couldn't leave because I couldn't afford to go buy a new wardrobe. Yeah. It's also very hard to get hired there. They called ACS a waiting room for the other name place. of that bank. Yeah. 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 I, I, I uh, it was, it was, uh, I mean, now, bless God, we're doing YouTube and, yeah. and uh, I'm very, very excited for you guys. Um, but, it was it was really difficult and um, you know you you just hope that you did some good in some people's life somewhere they still remember be like okay you know it was a blessing to be around those people I, mean, I was I was blessed to be able to work with you and it, yes. it genuinely it genuinely was but that place was uh, you know and I, and I like that both of us took personal accountability for ourselves we didn't blame the company for our own missteps yeah. Uh, and I'm big on that. At the same time, I will say that I preach this all the time to leaders. Like, leaders set the environment and the context. And mm -hmm. holy smokes, we had 100%. terrible, 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 terrible leadership. Mm -hmm. Terrible leadership. So, I don't know. The moral of the story is uh, if you find yourself in a leadership position, take sexual harassment seriously. Yes. And uh, get to know your folks. I think it'd be, it's a lot harder to kill someone in a in a real environment where there's real community and people know i believe that if we had an environment that you or you would have created that richard would have been afraid to kill donna i, I agree because with people at work would have missed her and would have stood for it but because he knew our environment and he knew that employees were not truly valued that was not a concern for him 100 percent so. When I, I mean, not to toot my own horn, when I think of my team, night team, 21 people, not a, there was no problems between anybody, not a single person because we had community. Exactly. And everyone was valued, and I was willing to go to bat for everyone. Mm -hmm. And in return, they gave me what I needed. They gave me those numbers. And um, I guarantee you that some bad decisions got reversed because of the type of environment you created. Mm-hmm. But we, we never figured that out at the macro level. You had little pockets where people were taking care of people, but at the macro level as a company, we didn't do that. And the crazy thing is, that was Michael Scott's greatest strength. Mm -hmm. He genuinely loved people, but he was just damn incompetent, bro. Mm -hmm. When Michael Scott <laughs> he was no, there, it was the uh, happiest time there. It was the happiest time, but he didn't have a, mm -hmm. uh, a gym. That was kind of like the competent underling that would kind of smooth out his problems. Yeah. He didn't have that. It was just Michael Scott. And so, God bless him, but he's not going to last very long, bro. Not in the corporation. So, there you go, guys. I mean, that's, yeah. that's yeah. all I got. Unless yeah. I, unless that's all I got. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. And I'm so happy that you came here. Yeah, thank you so talk much with us about for coming this. out and doing this. Oh, like, yeah. I especially, appreciate. like, so when we started the Misery Machine, I would mentioned this before to some of our viewers, like, we wanted to basically 
keep a record of everything that happened at ACS because the fact that it happened, that it's very rarely talked about, um, I just felt there's injustice in that, not letting people know what happened there. And there's very few people left that want to talk about it or even want to talk about these murders. So have you come on mm -hmm. and share you know, what you went through and your thoughts on it Like, means so much to us. Yeah. And to, like, not just to, you know, keep that, that everything awful happened in ACS going forward, but to, you know, help humanize and do justice the memories of Christiana and Donna. Because yeah. at the end of the day, when people get murdered here in Lewiston, they... They get erased, man. They, they like become they forgotten. Exist. Yep, 100%. So, you coming on here helps fight that. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, that was a major thing for me, um, for Donna and Christiana, and particularly Christiana. It just really got to me, bro, because like I said, like, the crazy, so so they would talk about Donna. They didn't lead off by saying, you know, call center work with Donna, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But then they would talk about that with Christiana. They would talk about her sex work. And I'm like, wait a second. She worked at the call center, too. Mm -hmm. you, couldn't, you couldn't mention that she worked. You just had to say that she was... You had to say that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, she was that. And, you know, that doesn't devalue her in any way, shape, or form. Not even point oh one. Her her chosen profession doesn't reduce her value as a human being. And for me, like, that was a big thing. Is like, I want Donna to get centered. I want Christiana to get centered. And, and I want her looked at as just a human being, period. Human being. And uh, we're, we're more than what we uh, can produce. 100%. So that's the lie that capitalism has, has, has told us, that you're only as valuable as what you can produce. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think that that's true. I think when you look at people that way, you create environments where Don and Christiana can happen. I'm not blaming capitalism. What I'm saying is there are certain environments where certain actions are more likely to happen than not, is what I'm saying. Right. And so that's an environment that it's an un, you know, sort of thought of byproduct of capitalism that I think we need to take a very good hard look at. So, and I, I appreciate you uh, both. I, I didn't get to hang with you a lot at work. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I, I, was, I was actually trying to find a way out. When, when I started becoming conscious of you at the site, I was just trying to get out of there. You, you're, you're the one that hired me the first yeah. day and the second time. I, yeah. I remember we, we were talking and then you asked me, like, uh, what's one thing uh, that uh, that you could tell me about yourself that you didn't learn in this interview? And um, oh, yeah. two, two things came up in my mind. One was like, oh, just give him the whole, like, go workaholic, stupid shit. And, yeah. But I was just like, yeah, you know what? I'm a musician. Like, I just, I don't know why. I just thought to tell you I was a musician. Then we started talking about music. Then we both found out we really loved the band Receiving End of Sirens. Yes, and, bro. And, and we like, we, yeah. I still we, talk about that band, dude. They're, they're amazing. Dude, they're amazing. That's two records of all time. I know. Bro. Oh, my God. Shout out to Receiving End of Sirens. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I, I remember remember that and then uh yeah that that was uh that's what got me. i don't know if that that alone got me hired but that was my first interview and that's how i ended up on your campaign oh, yeah, that definitely until got i you went hired. back to school yeah so he mentioned tree houses yeah. <laughs> make the kid a manager again yeah. uh and i just you know i got you back forever bro forever all right you. there you go i'm tired <laughs> i'm out here yeah uh, let, let everybody know who doesn't already know you where we can uh, find your channel uh well if if uh you're not watching this content which you should uh you can check us out vin and sorry we do uh music reactions and please check them out please vin and sorry because they're check awesome out. yes but uh these guys these guys are rock star best true crime show on the internet <laughs> bitches i'm out of here vin out thank you thank you